Uh, so our, uh, our speaker today, our guest today, Kenneth R. Miller, is the author of um, uh, the new book, The Human Instinct, that we'll be talking about in depth in a moment. He's a biology professor at Brown University and the author of the critically acclaimed Only a Theory and Finding Darwin's God. Uh, both of these covered a lot of science and religion topics, so I was surprised that there is no God in this book at all. In fact, this book could have been written by an atheist, which made me think, have you come over to the dark side yet? <laughs> Michael, I am praying for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> My soul to be saved. Well, nevertheless, we, we give you an uh, official skeptic pin Thank as you a so member. Much. And by the way, we also have a wine sponsor. Michael McCarran uh, makes uh, engraved wine oh, bottles for uh, corporate events and things like that. So he's our wine sponsor. So it's a nicely engraved uh, bottle of wine with your book cover. And all I have to do is figure out how to get past TSA. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's right. You never check that's luggage. I could, well, we can mail it to you. We'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Um, I mean, what does it say? A perky little vintage or something, something, something like that? Yes. <laughs> <It's evolving. laughs> That's right. Uh, and we have uh, two special guests today, um, Donald Prothero and Ed Larson. Don's our longtime paleontologist, geologist, leader of our Geo Tours, longtime speaker and uh, editor and, and uh, author of, of skeptic articles. And uh, Ed Larson is the author of The Summer of the Gods, the Pulitzer Prize winning book on the Scopes trial, Scopes monkey trial. So I've asked both of them to make a few comments today after our dialogue, before the Q&A, uh, in, in, in which they can comment on some of these great questions. We, we will be dealing with some of the, the biggest topics there are, because you deal with those. Mm -hmm. um, and so the subtitle of the book kind of explains at least to which direction we can take how we evolve to have reason, <laughs> consciousness, and free will. Before we get into this though, since you testified in the Dover trial, the very famous Dover trial in 2005, what's happened since then? How do you feel with 13 years of perspective about the intelligent design movement, where it's gone, what your role was in killing it or, or not? <laughs> okay, well, the, uh, I, I like to tell people that the, uh, the whole Kitzmiller trial was my fault. And the reason for that is my co-author and I, Joe Levine, had just come out with a brand new high school biology textbook. It's known by everyone who uses it as the dragonfly book because it has a beautiful image of a dragonfly on the cover. And the, uh, the, in the small town of Dover, Pennsylvania, Dover Area High School, the science department, which consists, by the way, of four people, that's how small the high school is, was told that the board finally had enough money to purchase new biology textbooks. And they looked around, they tried to find a book that met the Pennsylvania State standards, and they settled on our book, um, for which I was very grateful, of course. <laughs> um, but then they had to present it to the so-called curriculum committee of the school board. And unbeknownst to many of the people in town, fundamentalist Christians had just sort of taken over a majority on the school board at the most recent elections. And the chair of the curriculum committee, a fellow named William Buckingham, examined the book and he discovered not only that it had a chapter on evolution, it had a unit on evolution. <laughs> and when he read further, he discovered evolution was written throughout the book. You couldn't even skip the unit and get away from evolution. <laughs> right. And at one point, he told a local TV interviewer, from cover to cover, this book is laced with Darwinism. And you know how when you publish a new book, you put quotes on the back to help sell it? Yeah. Joe and I have talked about, let's put that quote on the back of our textbook. <laughs> um, and uh, and we'll, we'll take that as an endorsement. <laughs> It'll lace um, throughout, yes. So it turns out that this, the selection of this book was a provocative act as far as the school board was concerned because it had so much evolution in it. And they told the teachers, well, we're going to let you have the book, but only if you do two things. Uh, one is if you prepare an intelligent design curriculum over the summer to present as an alternative to evolution. And also, we're going to provide you with two classroom sets of an intelligent design textbook called Of Pandas and People. And that's right. where things started to roll right. along. Right. And I was, I, I was called up by the local representative from my publisher who uh, said, Ken, there's some issue about your textbook in this small town. Um, and I said, don't worry about it. I've dealt with this sort of thing before. I'll find who to talk to on the web. And I called up the uh, superintendent of schools, found his name on the web and his phone number. And I've done this many times before. And what I would usually tell to the superintendent or the science supervisor is give me the names of the people on the Board of Education who are concerned about our book. I'll call them up directly. I'll have a chat with them. I'll convince them. 
that this book represents the science main, scientific mainstream. Um, the authors of this book include a, a practicing Catholic and an observant Jew who are certainly not anti-religious, um, and usually that's that. And more often than not, when I would do this to a superintendent or a principal or a science supervisor, they say, oh, thank goodness, you take these guys off my hand. Please talk to them. <laughs> what the superintendent in Dover said was, that's very interesting. Um, please don't take any action. And if I'd like you to do anything, I'll call you. Oh, oh boy. And that was a little strange. Yeah. And I didn't know, quite know what was going on. Um, then I decided, well, I'm going to call up the chair of the science department. Uh, a wonderful woman named Bertha Spar, and um, Bertha immediately, uh, no, sorry, I forgot, I had emailed her first. And Bertha then called me up at my office and said, no more emails. And I said, excuse me, I don't even know who you are. I just said, and she said, emails are discoverable. Oh. Um, and, she <laughs> oh said, and she said, we're going to talk about this over the phone. Oh my God. And she told me <laughs> that she and her fellow teachers had adopted a strategy, and the strategy was, at the risk of losing their jobs, they simply would not assist in any way in the intelligent design curriculum. Um, and they stood up in front of the school board and they said exactly that. Wow. There would not have been a Kids Miller case without those heroic teachers in Dover wow. Area School District. And wow. they, they deserve all the praise they could possibly get for standing up for the integrity of science. So for me, that's the lead up. Yeah. Now, I don't know how long you want me to go on, because I can give a whole lecture about the Kids Miller well, trial. Well, uh, Nova had that sort of docudrama, which an actor the, played. Called, you. called Ju Judgment Day. That was, that was, to me, very distressing. It's very unusual to see yourself played by an actor. <laughs> um, the other thing is, anybody in this room can already tell how I talk. I'm a quick-talking guy. I grew up in New Jersey. I'm near New York City. This is the way I talked and testified in court. And for some reason, the actor who played me in the Nova series decided... Here is how an Ivy League college professor <laughs> should talk. <laughs> With sort of a highly educated pseudo-English accent. And I, and I found it distressing. Okay. Um, but that, that was But it was accurate. Yeah, it, it was word for word. Right. In other words, you know, they, they, used, uh, they used the actual transcript of the trial. But I'll, I'll put in, I don't know if anyone is here from the legal profession, but I put in one good word for the legal profession. <laughs> About... Four or five months before the trial began, I was in Philadelphia for a scientific meeting, and the two private attorneys who had taken the case pro bono from a, a you know a sort of a big mean corporate law firm, but this was the the good that they wanted to do, took me out to dinner at a very fancy restaurant. And they said, "Let's talk about the case." It was, the meal was wonderful, but I came away deeply depressed because I thought these guys don't know RNA from DNA. They don't even know what the fossil record is. They want to know if they can get it on CD. Um, and the, I'm going to have to carry this thing by myself. These guys are hopeless. By the time the trial began, these attorneys had at least a master's and maybe a PhD level understanding of evolution. Wow. The way in which they absorbed knowledge and applied it at the trial was absolutely astonishing. And the other remarkable thing about this is the, we knew we were going front, in front of a conservative judge, a lifelong Republican, a protege of Governor Tom Ridge, and a judge who had been recommended for the bench by then Senator Rick Santorum. Oh boy. So <laughs> none of us knew what to think. And he had bona, fide, bona fides conservative credentials. He was incredibly fair-minded. He was incredibly straightforward. And he also had an incredible sense of humor. Um, and at one point during my testimony on the first day, um, in a courtroom, you can't give a lecture. You have to structure it in terms of question and answer, as you know. Well, that's how we structured it. And we then had a series of court-approved demonstratives, which you and I would call PowerPoint slides, <laughs> which we showed right, to right. illustrate my answers to various questions. And at the end of about a two and a half hour session, it was a little afternoon time, it was obvious the judge wanted to break for lunch. And he raised his gavel to sort of end the morning session. And he said, not court dismissed, but he thought deeply and he said, class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> and, and, and to steal a phrase, that's when I realized this guy was a real mensch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. <laughs> so was it, evolution, was it the goal to prove evolution is true, that intelligent design is false, or it's not science, whatever it is? Well, here's the thing. Um, in a civil lawsuit, the plaintiffs have to present their case first. Right. So I knew that I would be followed several weeks later by the star uh, expert witness 
for the school board, and that was Michael Behe, oh, right. the biochemist from Lehigh oh. University, author of Darwin's Black Box, and probably the scientist in the intelligent design movement at the time with the best scientific credentials. So I had to do three things. We had three goals. Uh, the first thing is our, our textbook was an issue in this trial. So one of the things I wanted to make clear is how a couple of working scientists like myself and Joe Levine put together a textbook in terms of not just our personal views, but reflecting the scientific consensus, um, dealing with things in an objective and dispassionate way. And I wanted to under make sure the court understood that process. The second point that we wanted to do was to explain the scientific underpinnings of the theory of evolution in uh, terms that applied to structure, to physiology, to genetics, and to molecular biology. So it would be very clear that the word theory in this case doesn't mean a hunch, a guess, <laughs> right. a hypothesis. This means a broadly tested explanation that unites hundreds of thousands of observed scientific facts into a single explanatory framework. And that's what a scientific theory like the theory of evolution is. But then the third thing was I knew I'd be followed by Behe. So it was very important that I explain to the court in advance what Dr. Behe would say when he got on the stand and then explain in advance why it was wrong. And if I had, and we talked about this a lot in preparation, if I had unfairly uh, explained what he was going to say, if I had set up a straw man or something along those times, we would have basically set the stage for Behe to come in and say, I've been misrepresented. Here's what I really think, and I would not have had a chance to rebut. Oh, right. So therefore, the key here was to explain how he used the famous bacterial flagellum as an, as an example of irreducible complexity, why that example was wrong, how he used blood clotting as an example of something that required intelligent design. And then I had to explain to the court, we really do know a lot about, blood, uh, uh, about the evolution of the blood clotting system and so forth. And I believe I did so effectively. And the reason I did so effectively, the reason I say that is because when I read the dis judge's decision, point after point, when he discussed Dr. Behe's testimony, he said, but Miller explained this, and Miller did that, and Miller did the other thing. So is it the problem that they, their science is wrong, or they're not really even doing science? Uh, two for two. <laughs> um, this, is, this is an incorrect idea. It's empirically disprovable. You can't always prove things in science, but you sure as heck can disprove them. So that's, that's really the first thing. The second thing is there's very, very few attempts on the part of the Discovery Institute, which had funded the intelligent design movement, or any of the other boosters of intelligent design, to really do the kind of scientific work that anyone re would regard as the activity of a curious scientist who just wanted to find things out. Right. Um, there are a few experiments that are done by a number of scientists. There's a guy named Douglas Axe who uh, works in a, a research institute of sorts um, and publishes papers that are designed to show that certain folds in a protein are unevolvable, cannot be reached by evolutionary methods. These are fairly weak experiments. They're easily refuted. But what you don't see is the way a genuine scientist attacks a scientific problem with open-minded curiosity and with a vigor to try to basically put together an explanatory explanation. So in your sense that, uh, I mean, my feeling is that, that the 0506 dis trial decision pretty much closed the door for creationism uh, species of all kinds. Is that your sense too, or do, do you sense, sense them bubbling up here and there? God, I, I wish you were right, Mike. <laughs> um, what, one of the good things that happened, I can tell you two things in the aftermath immediately, which is the state of Ohio was considering, State Board of Education, was considering a series of recommended lessons for the Ohio science curriculum that would have included lessons that were basically an intelligent design. After the Kitzmiller trial, um, uh, activists in favor of science brought the Kitzmiller decision to the attention of those on the Ohio Board of Education who were wavering. And they basically they decided they did not want to have another Kitzmiller mm -hmm. trial in Ohio. Right. And they reversed that. So that was highly influential. The second, the second good outcome from this is I had actually been involved in a court case a year earlier in uh, Georgia. And this was the Cobb County textbook sticker case. Right. Yeah. And in Cobb County, um, a group of citizens prevailed upon the Board of Education to attach a warning sticker to every biology textbook purchased in the district, sort of like a pack of cigarettes. And it said on it, this textbook, textbook has material on evolution, 
evolution is a theory, not a fact, mm -hmm. regarding the origin of living things and so forth. And this was the famous sticker case. Well, a heroic guy named Jeff Selman, a New York City transplant, and five other parents sued uh, arguing in federal court, arguing that this was an attempt to promote not just religion, but a particular sectarian view of religion, and therefore was constitutionally impermissible. Right. Um, I actually testified in the first day of that trial uh, as well, at the invitation of Jeff and, and his attorney, and we won the case. But there were procedural abnormalities in this, in the way the judge structured it, and one that I became aware of in the, in the Kitzmiller case. In Kitzmiller, I was prepped, sworn in, and deposed as an expert witness. In the Cobb case, I simply showed up as a fact witness. And that was probably inappropriate, given the kinds of questions I was asked. So that was valid cause for appeal by the Board of Education, which did appeal. And the Federal Circuit Court sent it back to the district court for a retrial. The school board's attorney said, we're ready to go. We're going to retry the case, and we're going to keep the stickers in the textbooks. Hmm. What then happened was the victorious attorneys in the Kitzmiller case contacted them. And they contacted me, and they contacted Kevin Padian from Cal Berkeley, who'd been another expert witness in the Kitzmiller case, and said, if you want to go to trial with this again, you're not getting the legal team that was down there in Cobb, uh, Selman versus Cobb County before. You're getting the full Kitzmiller team. And that's, <laughs> and that's what you will have to contend right, with. Right. And the uh, attorney, the school board's attorney, then went back to the board and said, let's settle this and let's take the stickers out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in terms, in terms of bubbling up again... Uh, well, in other words, maybe the top-down strategies uh, using the legal system are, are not going to work, so they're going to have to do something from the bottom up. But they are. Okay. But they are. Yeah. And you can go to the National Center of Science Education's website, and you can find a state-by-state -state account of state legislatures that have introduced bills to water down or weaken or altogether strike uh, the subject of evolution, and for that matter, climate change, and for that matter, stem cell research, right. and so forth from the curriculum. And right now, um, there is a serious attempt by officials in the state of Arizona to basically remove evolution from the required life science curriculum in that state. And this is a serious <laughs> issue that people in that state and others should be concerned about. This issue hasn't oh, gone away. Wow, that's unfortunate. Indeed. Yes. I guess the problem other people in other countries have is not seeing that we don't have a central national board of education Indeed. that says this is the science that's going to be taught. It just comes down to local boards of education of counties. Yes, so you, th I, yeah. there must be thousands of possibilities that. Yeah, no, I think up. that I think that's true. Education, by tradition, in the United States is a local function, and and I think that as someone who's <laughs> been active in my own local local educational system, the public system where I live in Massachusetts, I think that's an important feature. It gives citizens direct involvement. It doesn't basically put it in the hands of a distant federal government, but it certainly leads to the kind of balkanization that right. you're implying. Uh, on the other hand. It also makes it very hard for a national authority to impose its will right. on individual school districts. And one example of a national government doing that is the country of Turkey, um, in right. which the federal authority essentially outlawed the teaching of evolution in the public schools. And the explanation from the prime minister's office was, this is a very complicated subject and it's too difficult for Turkish youth to understand. <laughs> um, and as a result, wow. and as a result um, evolution is disappearing Right. From, from schools in, in the country of Turkey. Right. Do you get undergraduates at, at Brown that are creationists, or you don't know? Did they say anything? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, Br Brown is a famously liberal place, okay? Yeah. And everybody knows that. In fact, very liberal. But I have to tell you, every year, I, I teach in the spring a, a, a very large first-year freshman biology class. This year, I had 350 students in it. Wow. They're wonderful kids. They're very enthusiastic. Um, I have a wonderful crop of teaching assistants, half of whom themselves are undergraduates who really throw themselves into this course. And we do all sorts of cool things. We do DNA sequencing. I have students bring in food from the cafeteria. I show them how to test it to see if it's been genetically modified. Um, <laughs> they, do all so they do all sorts of stuff. It's, it's really interesting, interesting course to teach. But every year I get two or three kids, and this year, this year I only had one, but two or three is the average who will come and see me, and because they're freshmen, and because I'm a full professor, they are very polite. And they always say, tap on the door, are you busy, <laughs> so forth and so on. And they ask this question in a very roundabout way about evolution and what they'll be required on exams and so forth. And when I realize where they're going, I often say, wait a minute, you want to know if 
you have to believe in evolution to get an A, don't you? And then they'll go, oh, God, yes. And I said, and, and what, what I said to the, to the student who came this year, and I said, what did I lecture about yesterday? And she goes, the Krebs cycle. And I said, I don't believe in the Krebs cycle. She said, what? I said, I don't believe in the Krebs cycle. I don't believe in DNA. I don't believe in RNA. Here's what. I understand the role that the Krebs cycle plays in intermediary metabolism. I understand and accept the scientific evidence for it. And I also understand why the biochemical community founds, finds the cycle to be a persuasive explanation for how we break down carbs, fats, proteins, and other compounds in order to generate chemical energy. All that I care about with evolution is that you understand the scientific evidence for it, that you understand why the scientific community finds it persuasive, and also that you understand its implications. Belief doesn't play a role in science. Right. Understanding does. And that usually diffuses the situation because it means I'm not going to grab them and throw them up against the laboratory wall and say, <laughs> do you believe in Darwin? <laughs> which, which is right. the fear that many of them have. I think a lot of uh, conservative and Christian brains uh, autocorrect evolution to atheism, immorality, communism, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they're really asking. Do I have to believe these other things mm -hmm. that I don't want to uh, if I have to accept this Krebs cycle and so on. And DNA yeah, and I, there was, a, there was a, a comment made at a school board hearing in Kentucky a couple years ago and it got headlines saying that the new next generation science curriculum, which is a national curriculum that states, states adopt voluntarily, um, uh, criticizing the evolution that was in it. It was one of the four pillars of the life sciences. And the critics said, these new evolution standards are socialist and fascist. <laughs> right. I, I have a daughter who teaches US government and political science at a local high school. She emailed me with that headline, this is the reason I found out about it the next day, and say, Dad, do the people who said that realize that socialism and fascism are opposites? <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, a lot of people don't know yeah, that. And, they and, really confuse. Well, my, my answer was, I'm pretty sure that all that person knows is that they're bad words. Yeah, yeah. And by applying right, those bad right. words to evolution, they think they've criticized it. I think the word belief shouldn't even be used in scientific context in that way. It's like, do you believe in liberal democracy is a different thing than do you believe in climate oh, yeah. change or something like that. Yeah. The no, word I, itself I, I, is too I, I believe, for example, the Red Sox have a pretty good shot yeah. this year in the, Ameri in the American, American League East. And it certainly is not an empirical belief. <laughs> right. uh, but it, it's, it's, one, it's one shaped by sentimentality and a right. certain amount of judgment. But the, the, the idea of belief in science runs counter to the idea that every single thing in science is potentially disprovable. Um, what I tell my graduate students is we only have one dogma in science, and that is that science has no dogma. Right. Take it from there. Right. Yes, I like to, to make the point on the idea of consensus in science. It's not like a democracy where you guys all meet on the weekends and vote. Right. Uh, it's that there's independent lines of inquiry, this sort of convergence of evidence, consilience of inductions, uh, that all jumps to the same conclusion. Most of the time, these scientists don't even know each other. They go to different conferences, they publish in different journals, and, uh, and, and the same thing with climate, uh, climate and, and evolution science. So um, you'd have to refute each and every one of those, not just some generalized idea, which is... Yeah, and, and, and actually, I'll, I'll make two points. One is, um, I often run into people who think, well, you, talking about me, you can't possibly speak out against evolution, even though you probably know it's not true, because all scientists are together That's in this right, grand yes. conspiracy. <laughs> right. And my answer is, have you ever been to a scientific <laughs> meeting? Have you seen us shouting and yelling at each other? The yeah. notion of a conspiracy that would silence science is, is hilarious. The other point that you made about multiple lines of evidence converging. There's a very famous letter, I believe 1996, that of all people, Pope John Paul II wrote to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And he talked about the theory of evolution. And he said, the convergence of so many lines yeah. of evidence, and by that he meant molecular biology, genetics, biogeography, paleontology. This convergence neither expected nor sought was one of the most powerful arguments in favor of the theory of evolution. So when I'm in front of religious audiences and I want an argument for authority, from authority um, in favor of evolution, I go with the Pope. <laughs> right. Isn't that the one where he said, except for the soul, at the at ensoulment point, science ends? When I wrote the book Finding Darwin's God, one of the first things that happened to me when it came out is I was literally summoned 
by the theology department of Providence College across town in Providence, which is a Dominican university. And I went there, happy to do it, and was grilled by the theology and, and, and philosophy professors there. And the first question is, um, what is your position on ensoulment? <laughs> and my answer was, what does that mean? Okay. And yeah. they then explained it to me. And I'm a lifelong Catholic, so I shouldn't have had it exp explained to me. Yeah. But what John Paul II was trying to do is to say, look, there are certain beliefs that people of faith have, and one of those is in the reality of a spiritual self. And this is a question, the existence of the spirit, the existence of the soul. This is a non-scientific question. It's beyond the province of science to investigate. And therefore, evolution properly says nothing about it. So to that extent, do you still endorse uh, Steve Gould's uh, NOMA, non-overlapping magisterial, there's certain questions that science can't answer, although a lot of them I think we can take a shot yeah. at, but something like ensoulment or the resurrection or something like this is maybe just out of bounds. There's just no way to test it. Um, well, a couple things. One is, uh, Steve was a friend of mine. I, I taught at Harvard for six years before I went to Brown. Steve and I served on a committee together. We became good friends. We bonded over baseball, of all things. <laughs> of course. Um, and I really didn't re realize who he was. I knew. I knew he had a lab in the museum and he worked on snails, but that's all I knew. <laughs> until, quite seriously, until I got interested in evolution to discover, oh my God, S.J. Gould, S.J. Gould, all these books. Um, uh, absolutely amazing. And in 1982, not long after I came to Brown, um, I hosted him for a seminar and he showed up in my office. He had been named Scientist of the Year that year by Discover Magazine. So there's a photo crew there, so he shows up in my office. And after we talked about a few things, he pulled out of his briefcase the most beautiful envelope I have ever seen on this parchment vellum paper. And there was a yellow and white ribbon around it and a wax seal, which oh, he had wow. broken to open it. And it was this beautiful invitation from the Pontifical Academy oh, of wow. Sciences <laughs> wow. to attend a meeting in, in Rome at the Vatican um, on evolution and its meaning for, for the human species. And he said, Ken, you're a Catholic, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, what do you know about the Pontifical Academy of Sciences? <laughs> And I said, well, I don't know much, except I do know that the church thinks they've kind of mishandled the whole Galileo thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and they don't want to get into that again. Right. Um, so the Pontifical Academy has eminent scientists, Nobel laureates, um, who meet periodically for purely scientific reasons, but also, when asked, will offer advice to the Holy See on, on questions of science. Um, and then Steve looked at me and said, does the Pope know that I'm a Jewish kid from Brooklyn? <laughs> and I decided to have some fun with him, and I said, the Pope knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> but if you take that date in 1982, and you follow Steve's columns in Natural History Magazine, which are still worth reading, all of them, you discover his attitude towards religion mellowed after 1982 and 1983, and that's when Noma came out. Right. And I think part of that was for the first time in his life, he went to a conference and met large numbers of people whom he could respect as a scientist who were also people of faith. And I think that, that ultimately is the, is the ontogeny of non-overlapping ministeria. Now, I've read and reread Rocks of Ages, which is the book in which this is advanced. I think it's a fruitful way of thinking, but I think in some respects it's too clever by half. And the reason for that is science and faith can't run in completely separate troughs. Um, science tells us about the nature of the world. And understanding the nature of the world, I think, is essential for people of faith. Um, I don't think one can be an informed religious person without being literate and understanding and supportive of science. And I also don't think um, that, uh, that, that science can exist without lessons in terms of moral lessons, in terms of the imperative of how we treat fellow human beings without some lessons from people of faith. That doesn't mean it's necessary for scientists to be religious. But it does mean that science evolved, if you will, within the Western religious tradition. Um, basically, the idea that human beings are made in the image of God, and therefore all human beings are entitled to respect. And it's very interesting to me that even though in, in technological terms, uh, many Eastern societies in China and other places were more advanced than medieval or early Renaissance Europe was. Um, the scientific view, the scientific perspective of seeing humans as apart from nature and therefore becoming an objective observer, that's something that developed out of the Western 
Abrahamic tradition. And we see that not just in the Christian countries of Western Europe, but also in the Islamic countries of the Middle East and, and Northern Africa, where there was an enormous flowering of science in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. So I think, basically, people in science should realize that to the extent that science is a cultural production, it is a cultural production of the Abrahamic way of looking at the world and our relationship to it. But Gould kind of separated questions like uh, meaning and morality belong to religion and science has nothing to say about that. Well, there's a lot of us that think it can say something about that. And in fact, in reading your book, I sort of felt like you are addressing some of those deeper yeah. questions that now maybe some religious traditions get some things right simply by having a theory of human nature by observation, like the golden rule and its metallic variations is something <laughs> like reciprocal altruism and some yeah, of the, very much the, so. the, the kinds of a Rawlsian a just society where you, you don't know who you're going to be in the, in the group, so you have to kind of put yourself in the other perspective. Th those are the kinds of things religions kind of figured out. It's not super rocket science. To, if you just interact with other people, you know that, that they feel like you do. Uh, but, 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 but so why should they be separate? And so that brings me to, to your new book. Again, there's no religion in here, you, uh, which I like. You, would, you just wanted to argue purely from reason and empiricism towards some of these uh, answers to some of these deeper questions. And my feeling was that you were arguing against probably Dawkins' most famous quote um, that, that several of us have used. I think this was in River Out of Eden. Mm -hmm. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So you can see when the average person reads that and thinks, that's evolution, that's that, Darwinism, that, I have to take that? I mean... That's pretty bleak, isn't it's it? It's pretty yeah. bleak, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and it's and in fact, grim. I have to tell you, in 2002, I, was, I shared the platform with Richard at a conference on faith and secularism in the United States at NYU. Um, and uh, this is the first time I'd actually met him. Uh, and uh, Richard has always treated me very generously. I consider him a friend. Uh, he said nice things about me in The God Delusion, um, pointed out a few other things. He's recommended my book to Christians in Britain who want to understand evolution, so he's a good guy as far as I'm concerned. But I, from memory, I threw that quote at him. And I said, Richard, how do you manage to get up in the morning? <laughs> right, right. And, and, and I want your, your listeners and viewers to imagine this in the best Oxford accent you possibly can, <laughs> and that is, well, the universe may not have a purpose, but I do. <laughs> and that was, full uh, stop. Yeah, yeah. Full, full stop. But, but, but to me, the interesting thing about that, and uh, w when, I, when, I, when I lecture to lay people, I will often show the Dawkins quote. And then I will say, here's a counter quote. And the counter quote is that the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom the work of a provident and purposeful God intent upon human meeting, intent upon giving humans meaning to their lives, and intent on an ethical system in which we exist. Now, um, that is not a scientific statement, and I'm very quick and happy to point that out. But do you know what? Dawkins' statement is not a scientific statement either. Um, when well, you say, I think, I think when you say there's, no such, there's no purpose in the universe, yeah. that must mean there's a scientific test for purpose, uh, and I don't mm. think there is. It depends what you mean by the word purpose. So the purpose of a star is to convert hydrogen into helium when it hits a certain temperature and pressure, and that's what it's designed to do by the laws of nature, and it does it. So that's purposeful behavior in a way, it, it, just like river runs downhill or or species reproduce, or you know, whatever the basic instincts. I, I might say you're confusing purpose with function. Well, but so okay, that's fine. But but uh, the words we use do have certain meanings, and, sure. and we mean different things by them. I think what Richard's after there is that the average person thinks to get purpose, there has to be something outside of the system Indeed. that validates it, and he's saying there is no such thing. So it has to come from within. But as I take your book, uh, is that you can derive it from the bottom up. Just evolution designed us to have functions. So our functions are to have certain drives towards something. So, it, and that starts with the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. Everything's running down. So the whole point of the, sort of the first law of life is the second law of thermodynamics is to push back against entropy. Uh, to capture energy and use it and process it and so on, that's purpose. If Maybe that's too basic a, a use of that word. But from there, you can build, I think, much follows. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. Now, you remarked a couple times that there's no religion in this book. 
Um, and one of the reasons for that is, frankly, I wanted to reach a wider audience. And for me, the driving force is what I consider um, the rather bleak view of human nature and human significance that one can get by reading certain very, very able popularizers of evolution. Um, and it's quite easy, uh, not just to read Richard Dawkins, but to read a host of other people who will say there's nothing special about human beings. We're just one animal among many. Our existence is not significant at all. Um, and then furthermore, um, we are so intensely programmed by the realities of natural selection that ethics, morality, meaning, all of these things are simply illusions. And therefore, um, there's a lot of sound and fury in here signifying nothing, to steal a phrase from William Faulkner. Um, and, 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 and that view has caught on with a lot of people who are not opponents of evolution, who are not creationists. And the example that I use most cogently in the book is Marilyn Robinson, right. the, 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 the great writer, the Pulitzer Prize winner, um, who wrote several years ago a book called The Death of Adam. And the longest essay in that book is one called On Darwinism. And she's not an anti-evolutionist, so she's not a creationist. But by Darwinism, she means an interpretation of evolution that, in her view, debases the human, human spirit, that, 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 that belittles human existence, and basically says we are nothing more than another beast, and our existence is of absolutely no significance. I think that's an unduly bleak view of evolution. I think Robinson has got that wrong, but she certainly can quote an awful lot of popularizers of evolution right. who take exactly that point of view. And when I was writing the drafts for this chapter, these chapters in this book, um, my editor was constantly talking with me at Simon & Schuster about what's the bottom line? Where are you going with this? What's the bottom line? And when I finally sent her the draft, and I think it was for chapter five, she called me up and said, I finally figured out what your book is about. It's a pep talk for the human species. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. It's an optimistic view rather than a pessimistic Indeed. view uh, of this bottom-up process. So let's just start with, uh, w let's just go through the big three, reason, consciousness, and free will, uh, and then we can get to, to more religious issues at the end if we want. But um, So we think about the purpose or function of a heart is to pump blood, kidneys is to clean blood, and so on. What's the purpose or function of a brain? Uh, I mean, that's really kind of what, what is reason? What is it we're, we're, we're able to do? And somehow dogs can't do it like we can do it. And somewhere between Australopithecine, chimp-sized brain, to Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and us, something happened where the quantitative increase of neurons or neural structures or mm -hmm. neural networks or something, something, the way it's usually put is the lights came on. <laughs> but, but I think it more of is, is a dimmer rather than a switch. Uh, and it's just coming on more and more. Uh, and somewhere, whatever we, we use the word reason like it's a special thing, it, it is a special thing, but, but it's just a gradation more than what, you know, simpler structures can do. So what's the, t t talk to us about the brain, what its purpose is in that sense, like a biologist would any other organ. Well, I'm a biologist, and to me, biologically, the brain is just another organ. Um, and we see brains, we see complicated nervous systems in what we sometimes call the higher animals. But we see them in simpler animals as well. Uh, one of the organisms that I, my lab doesn't study, but a lot of labs at Brown do study, is a tiny little, uh, tiny little nematode called Cenorhabditis elegans. Uh, it's a beautiful little thing under the microscope. It has just under a thousand cells, and we know the names of every one of those cells. <laughs> That's why we study it. It's about three, maybe four millimeters long, so it's really small. Um, and it's a great model system to study development, particularly of the nervous system. And what the small brain of this little worm enables it to do is to react to the environment, to coordinate its own functions, to control muscle groups in an organized way. This worm wriggles and it swims. And in order to do that, you need a brain that, to control those muscles in an orderly fashion. Um, the majority of the cells, and I'm pretty sure about this, the majority of cells in our brains are doing the same thing because the cerebellum, uh, in the back of the brain, which coordinates the various functions of the body and the limbic system and so forth, um, that's really packed with cells to a greater density than other parts of the brain. So that's one of the functions. Um, what's happened in, to the human brain, however, compared to our primate relatives, is extraordinary. And one of the things that's absolutely striking is from about four million years ago until about one million years ago, which is a geological instant, 
the brain more than tripled in size. And thinking about an organism in which one organism, one, sorry, thinking about an organism in which just one organ tripled in size relative to the others, that's extraordinary. Yeah. And to this day, we puzzle as to what caused this hypertrophy of the nervous system. Was this a selective advantage? Uh, was this the result of genetic drift? Was it happenstance? And it's really very hard to tell, and there are no completely cohesive theories at this point. But what happened as a result, and there are a couple of papers that I quote in this book, is that the old organization of the primate brain, which we see in our close relatives, in chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans, that old organization became profoundly disrupted. It's not just that the brain got bigger, but older connections were broken and newer connections were formed, primarily in the cortex, which is the area in the surface of the brain, which is real, what neurobiologists sometimes call the connectome of how all these neurons are connected. And these novel connections gave rise, and we can see this in human artifacts and culture, to the development of language, of art, uh, to our uh, success in social groups, and to everything that we associate with being human. So we don't really know what the driving force was, I think it's a mistake to assume that every capacity of the brain is the direct result of natural selection, but clearly these capacities are there. Or sexual selection. Yeah, or, or sexual selection. So for example, in, you know, as you know, um, I re read and was very much influenced by your terrific book on Henry R Russell Wallace. Oh, thank you. Um, I knew a lot about Wallace before, but I knew an awful lot more after I read your book, and that caused me to delve into some of Wallace's original writings. Wallace, of course, was the co-discoverer of the theory of evolution with Darwin. Darwin might not have published for 10 more years or so, <laughs> yeah. unless Wallace had sort of prop poked and prodded him. And Darwin was always very generous in giving equal credit nice. to Henry Elsa Wallace. And Wallace was very much an adaptationist. He was always stressing the importance of natural selection. But one thing really puzzled him, as you pointed out quite well in your book. And that is, um, clearly, natural selection shaped a brain that could survive, evade predators, hunt, develop techniques like farming, find a mate, raise children, and all these other sorts of things. These are necessary for survival. We can understand why natural selection favors them. But why is it that human beings have a brain that's capable of doing differential calculus, right. of composing symphonies, of painting masterpieces? Clearly, um, the tribesmen of New Guinea were not naturally selected for their ability to calculate the derivative of a hyperbolic function. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, no matter how much trouble you all had with math, um, all of us have a brain that can do exactly that. Now that's where Wallace began to delve into mysticism right. and say this must be a divine property. The way in which I would describe it, and I've, other neuroscientists like Randy Buckner, whom I quote, uh, quote in my book, is to say this hypertrophy of the brain gave us capacities that had really not been favored by natural selection, but were there nonetheless. And it's from these capacities that the things that are distinctly human developed. So here, maybe let's make a distinction between adaptations that have design or purpose behind them, functional purpose, versus the spandrels or, or pre-adaptations or whatever sure. word we want to use. Gould's favorite example was the panda's thumb. It's, right. not a, it's not a beautifully designed thumb at all. It's just the radial sesamoid bone. But there, there's a lot of things like that that we have to be careful that every time you look for, like, what's the purpose of music? Well, it, it, it brought people together and they were naturally selected to be uh, social or something like that. You're looking for an adaptive purpose. Yeah. Maybe it's what Steve Pinker calls cheesecake, <laughs> evolutionary cheesecake. It just came along with it for some other purpose mm -hmm. that, uh, that we don't see anymore. So maybe just make the distinction for us between an adaptation and a spandrel. Well, the, uh, the, 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 I'm sure many of your viewers and listeners and people here are familiar with a, an extraordinary essay called the, the Spandrels of San Marcos that was written by Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton. And um, that alone, reading that essay, made me want to visit that cathedral in Venice. <laughs> uh, and I finally got the opportunity to do that just a couple years ago because okay. I wanted to see these spandrels yeah. for myself. And I'm, I'm not very good, I'm not very adept at describing architecture. But the great cathedral of St. Mark, San Marcos in Venice, um, basically has a series of domes. And the domes form a series of basically, you say, canopies over the floor of the cathedral. And the co four corners of each dome are held up by pillars. And as a result, the shape of the dome comes down into a triangular taper on the pillars. And these triangular tapers have a name. They're called spandrels. 
and they are beautifully decorated with paintings of the apostles, the life of Christ, seen from the Old Testament, and all these other sorts of things. And a person who did not understand the architecture might think that the architect designed these beautiful triangular spaces precisely so that art could be put in them. The fact of the matter is that once you decide that the Romanesque dome is going to be your architectural feature and you put several of them together, the spandrels just show up because that's what happens at the intersections of two domes. So they're not designed into it, they're a consequence of something else. Now the idea of a, a evolutionary spandrel is basically Gould and Lewontin's argument against hyper-adaptationism, which is to look at every single characteristic of an organism and say, what is it for? How did natural selection favor it? Now, there's some characteristics that obviously natural selection favored, and that's why we've got them. But there are other characteristics that, like the spandrels in the cathedral, sort of came along for the ride as the consequence of other characteristics. Um, and the joke that he made um, is a, a, a famous uh, satirical musical from the 19th century um, asking the question, what is the purpose of a nose? <laughs> and the answer in that satire was, to hold eyeglasses, obviously. <laughs> um, and the nose actually, you know, the nose is very good for, for holding eyeglasses, right. but no one would say that's the reason we have a nose. So do you think reason is a byproduct of something else, or is it directly adaptive because it helps us make predictions better or uh, survive uh, and reproduce better? Well, um, the, the way I would put it is, is this, and that is that there are an awful lot of other animals um, that uh, are able to survive and reproduce in environments very similar to the ones that we grew up in that we would not say are capable of reason at the level of a professor of philosophy right. or a mathematician and so forth. And they managed to get by just fine. So there's something about the level of, uh, of, 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 of cognitive function in terms of reason that human beings have that I certainly think surpasses um, any strictly adaptationist explanation. Um, the, uh, the, uh, and again, you know, look at the animals that are most similar to us. They're very clever. Um, they can learn signs and symbols and communicate. But there is a gulf that's many orders of magnitude between us and them. And you can see a kind of reasoning in them. I can see a kind of reasoning in my dog um, in terms of him watching my baby. He's an Australian shepherd, and this partially explains it, because these oh, are they're very, sharp. very intelligent animals. Yeah. And when you get an Australian shepherd as it grows up, the first thing it does is make a study of you <laughs> and learn what your habits are and right. learn when you will not give it a treat and when you might. And <laughs> yeah. I don't, it doesn't just run around bay. He doesn't waste the effort on that. He very <laughs> carefully understands my moves and habits and he's able to connect certain gestures in certain times of day with the time when I'm likely to, 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 to give him some food and reinforce that. So reasoning is not an all or nothing. I think yeah. it's present in other animals as well. But it's, it, it, its presence in the human being, I think, is related to that incredible hypertrophy that resulted in the remodeling of the brain. So I don't think it's entirely adaptational. Right. Now, there's an argument made by a, a historian of science who's also an animal tracker who uh, argues that tracking, just hunter-gatherers that are tracking animals are using a kind of reasoning in which they, they look at like the, the, the hoof prints or the pad where it was sleeping and they can see how long ago it left. Now the sun is over here, it's this temperature, so they probably went in that direction and, and, and then uh, you know, infer from there that they you know, left three hours ago, so we go this way. That's a kind of hypothesis formation. Oh, indeed prediction, testing of the hypothesis that you then scale up to like a scientific method. I think that's true. And, and I think certainly um, we were adapted for that in the Pleistocene in terms of hunter-gatherers and so forth. Um, but I don't think it explains the entire capacity that human beings have. Right. To, just to go back to Henry Russell Wallace's Alfred concern. Russell Wallace, yeah. Albert Russell, Alfred, sorry about Alfred, that. Yeah. 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 Um, in terms of, does that explain the ability to do higher mathematics? Right, does that yeah, explain yeah. the symphony and that sort of stuff? Right. Well, that could be a, just a span. It just comes along with it. Yeah, Although it doesn't seem like tracking animals would have the same level of quantum physics. I so. agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, and, and then that brings us to consciousness, the other big, uh, this mm -hmm. is such a loaded subject. But so you have the easy problem, the hard problem, the easy problem. Yeah. You know, uh, how do we explain the neural correlates of whatever it is we're, we're doing? Yeah. 
Uh, and so you look at the visual cortex, you can track the neural networks that fire when you see a face. You, you discussed that mm -hmm. research showing that 200 neurons is all you need to recognize a human face. This is extraordinary. The, it, w our brains are enormously complicated. They probably have between 70 and 80 billion neurons in them. But it turns out that facial recognition is concentrated in a very small number. And there's so, uh, some recently carried out experiments in which investigators were able to show people pictures of faces and monitor the activity in about 200 neurons, as you say. And just from monitoring the activity in those neurons, determine with a high degree of accuracy which face they were looking at. Right. And that comes very close to determining the neural correlates of consciousness in terms of which nerve cells are firing when you are conscious or perhaps experience experiencing a particular image or sensation. Right. I like your discussion on the hard problem. So the so-called hard problem is, that's the easy problem, which is really not that easy, but it's at least it's okay. solvable. Yeah, the, the, the people who've described the easy problem <laughs> have said this is easy, not because we're gonna solve it even in the next century, right. but it's easy because we can see how the tools of science might enable us to solve right. it. That's, that's right. what makes it, it makes, I prefer tractable problem right. rather than easy right. problem. Well, I say in my next Scientific American column, which I call the New Mysterians, the Mysterians are those that claim there are certain uh, problems that are, by definition, insoluble in science. They'll never be solved. Not because they're super hard, it's just they're, concept they're misconceived, they're conceptual, conceptual problems. And I think the hard problem is one of those. That is, what's it like to be something else? What, what, what's it like to be you? Or, you know, does your green look the same as my oh, green? Oh, boy, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, <laughs> And, and of course, Green, huh? <laughs> okay. because, uh, and I mentioned this book, when I was a little kid, I remember thinking about, my favorite color was red, okay, it still is, I drive a red pickup truck, okay, um, my favorite color was red, and I remember thinking, I wonder if Bobby Lanigan, my friend across the street, <laughs> when he sees Bobby. something red, does red seem the same to him that it does to me? Maybe his sensation is actually green, when mine was red, and how would I tell? And I, I told, and people say, well, you can tell him that fire is red, but no, maybe he sees fire as green, and he calls that red, right. and I can't tell what the sensation right. is. Right. Now, the interesting thing is that we are very close to being able to figure out the neural correlates of the sensation of red. And what I mean by that is which specific input, in, in, inputs <coughs> come out of the rods and cones through the optic nerve to tell the visual cortex in the brain that is the color red. That's an easy problem. But determining the inner self in terms of what is that sensation, what is the sensation of red, that's part of the hard, hard problem. Yeah, see the, to me the conceptual problem is that it's still this uh, idea there's a little homunculus in there with the theater of the mind and that my homunculus leaps into your head to see what your red looks like on the, your screen. Of course, there's no such thing as like that. Although you do point out that you know, in the famous Thomas Nagel essay, what's it like to be a bat? You know, we can turn and, and, and yell at the wall and something bounces off with your eyes closed or blindfolded. And you kind of have a feeling like, well, that's, I can tell that's the back and that's the front just based on the, uh, on the echolocation. So being a bat must be something like that. But to really, really, truly be a, feel what it's like to be a bat, you'd have to have all the sonar equipment and the neural uh, architecture to run it and so on. At some point, you would just be a bat. You wouldn't be Ken Miller wondering yeah. what it's like to be yeah. a bat. You'd just be a bat. Yeah. Maybe you're a bat wondering what it's like to be Ken Miller, but, uh, yeah. and, and, but and, then and, you'd and, never know. Yeah. And I'll go a little, I'll go a little further. Um, think of every color you can imagine. In other words, think of the entire visual spectrum, even the colors we don't have names for. It's every imaginable color. We can't see anything in the ultraviolet. That is a non-color to us. Right. Birds can see the ultraviolet. What color does that look like to them? Right. That's a puzzling yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Do they have something else up in their visual spectrum that is like a color we can't conceive or think of? Right. And it's a pu it's a puzzling thing to think about. Do you know uh, Donald Hoffman's the uh, interface theory of perception? I'm afraid I don't. Okay, so he's a UC Irvine cognitive psychologist. I discovered him because Deepak Chopra started sending me his papers, and then I, <laughs> and then I figured out why, uh -huh. because he's basically saying there's no way to know what reality is. Evolution didn't design us to understand. Uh, accurate uh, perceptions of reality for the very reason you just gave. So his model is that, imagine a, a computer 
laptop screen, and there's the little trash can, for example. But if you open it up and look at the circuitry there, there's no trash can. There's no there. trash can. Right, so, so, uh, so the metaphor is that everything is just, they're just icons. Everything in the world we see, they're just icons in there. And Deepak's always asking me, all right, Shermer, where's the red in your head? Now, I may actually be able to answer it <laughs> because of this very research you cited. But, you know, where's the Milky Way galaxy in, in your cortex? You know, it, it's in there somewhere, but it's just neurons firing. Uh, so that there's some loss of fidelity between the perception of what's out there, and we can never actually know what's out there. Now, my rebuttal to this is what it's like to be a dolphin in this sense that, yeah, the dolphin's image of a shark on its brain is probably completely different, its picture of a shark than mine. But there really are things in the ocean that have teeth on one end and a tail at the other end, and it's good to be away from them. Uh, <laughs> or else you're gonna get eaten. So natural selection must have created, not, not just completely randomness of what the world looks like, but some approachment of fidelity of what the real world is like. We are well adapted to perceive a reality, and it's a reality that promotes our own survival, existence, and reproduction. There's absolutely no question about that. But to me, and I've emphasized this repeatedly in my book, there's something that makes us humans different. And here's what the something is. And that is we can actually analyze and compensate for the imperfections of our own perception. Mm. And that is we know when we're, we may be fooled by an optical illusion, but eventually we have the curiosity and the intellect to figure out why the optical illusion works the way in which it does. There's a, a wonderful book that I quote from a couple times. It's called Kluge. Oh, yeah. by Gary Marcus at NYU. Yeah, he's very good. Um, I'm sure, hey, I'm in California. Everybody knows what a kludge is, <laughs> which is a very, very poorly designed system or especially a poorly designed computer program. Um, and I put a an anecdote in the book that I'm sure you remember. Um, I, I, learned, I learned computer programming in the 60s um, where I had to write my programs into punch cards <laughs> and feed them into a hopper and run them in batch and so forth. Um, I passed the course but every time I would write out my programs and take them to a consultant, they would shake his head and say, boy, Miller, this is a real kludge. <laughs> and it, it was not a compliment. Mm -hmm. It meant something that was poorly designed, awkward, used more instructions than necessary, had potential pitfalls, all sorts of stuff. Marcus makes the point that our brain is a kludge. It's not a perfectly designed instrument. It's prone to all sorts of things, misperceptions, these optical illusions. If anybody's been listening to the, what is it, the Yanni? Oh yeah, or Laurel, Laurel or Yanni. <laughs> um, we're actually prone to auditory illusions, illusions as yeah, well. Yeah. But what makes the human mind different is that we are aware of these imperfections. We can study them, and as Marcus put it, we can outwit the inner kludge. And that is something that I think is uniquely human. Yeah. So I think that also gets us to the free will issue that um, unlike other species, we can be aware of the determining factors in our lives and then try to work around them. Like my example is, I know if I go to the supermarket hungry, I'm going to buy the ice cream and the chocolate chip cookies and the stuff. I should. If I've just had a meal, then I only get the healthy stuff. So knowing that future Shermer of what he's like, and there's a funny Simpsons episode where, where Homer's trying to decide if he should eat the donut or not. And he says, he finally decides, oh, that's future Homer's problem, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we have that capacity. We can yeah. say, okay, I know I'm weak, or I, you know, if I want to break the habit of cigarettes or whatever, uh, I know the variables. And now we actually have research. You could read books like uh, 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 the Willpower book by uh, uh, Baumeister, Roy Baumeister, mm -hmm. in which he has, here's all the research about like how, how to eat uh, how, to, how to resist the marshmallows so you can have two of them later, th this sort of thing. Um, so is, for you, this is, and I think for me too, this is kind of where free will, whatever you want to call it, comes into play. We can, we're part of the causal net of the universe, but we're also can affect the future causal mm -hmm. variables in the way that we want to direct them. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, um, I, I would say, first of all, it's very easy to make an argument against free will. Because in terms of making an argument against free will, what you're basically saying is, hey, there's nothing spooky up here. There's not a little me that's right. inside no, many, there many. Yeah. that's making these decisions without precedent. And as a, as a biologist, I will tell you, I believe there is absolutely nothing that happens up here that is uh, not explicable in terms of the laws of physics and chemistry and the cell biology of connections in the brain. So I think the brain is an entirely natural system in every respect. No ghost in the machine. No ghost in the machine. 
Um, so what does that mean with respect to free will? Well, one of the people that I took on in the chapter on free will, of course, is Sam Harris, who recently wrote a short little book, almost a pamphlet, on free will. And Harris's target, I strongly suspect, Harris's target was theism. Um, in the argument against free will, because he knows that free will is kind of a correlate of Abrahamic religions and many other world religions as well, that we have a free choice between good and evil, between right and wrong. And Harris argues that we don't, um, and he argues basically that there is no ghost in the machine, nothing spooky, um, the brain is an entirely deterministic machine, and so forth. Now, as you pointed out, in your soon-to-be-published, and you were kind of semi a pre print <laughs> um, Scientific American uh, column this coming month, um, there is quantum indeterminacy which is built into the brain, um, and that makes neural actions to some degree unpredictable, but that's hardly the same as free will. Um, and one of the things I mentioned in my chapter on free will is, yeah, you can map quantum indeterminacy into a kind of free will, but that's not really a kind of free will worth having. We right. want something more than that. Um, here's the curious thing, though. Uh, that is, I think the real question is not whether there's any spooky violation of causation going on in the brain, but rather whether or not the brain is an instrument that can take in input and can use the tools that we've been talking about, reasoning and perception, to come to decisions on the basis of evidence. Um, and if we do not have such a tool up there, then science itself is suspect. And nobody realized this better than Stephen Hawking. And one of the quotes I drew from Hawking, and I can't reproduce it exactly, I apologize for that, is, is the statement that he had spent his whole life searching for a final theory, which would explain not only the origin of the universe, but everything that has happened in the universe since its origins, in terms of step-by-step, -step, causation here, causation there, and so forth. Yet the paradox is that if we lack free will, that theory would have specified its own discovery <laughs> in terms of deterministic right. events, right. and therefore we would have no reason for believing the theory to be actually true. Right. And another way of putting it is that science itself is dependent upon the ability of an individual scientist to design, execute, and then evaluate an experiment. And if our reaction to that and our plotting of the experiment is predetermined, then we really have no way of knowing whether or not right. science itself is valuable. And finally, and I, I'm sorry, I'm just ranting and raving about oh, no, this. this is good. There's this wonderful passage in Sam's book where he talks about how much better our lives would be if we accepted the fact that we don't have free will because we could then design more equitable criminal justice mm -hmm. systems, mm -hmm. we'd bring up kids better and all this other sort of stuff. And I'm reading this, I'm stepping back and saying, here's an author who does not have free will in terms of choosing his words, urging his readers who do not have free will either to accept that they don't have free will because it will improve their lives. <laughs> yeah. And there is, yeah. there is a very deep paradox. There's a, there's a in, lot, of active, in, in, in lot of active verbs in, in, yeah. in, in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, I mean, I just kind of presented this to Sam when he and I did a public event in Austin uh, last month. And so his answer to this is, you know, that we are in the causal net, like I can push the variables, is that, no, no, it, it's, it's basically tumors all the way down. It's neural networks all the way down. And the fact that, let's say I'm in the middle of the bell curve of willpower. I'm pretty good, better than some, weaker than others. Uh, but all that's just determined by my genes, my upbringing, my parents, my peer group. Uh, I, I'm not choosing how much I can tweak the variables and be aware of them. That's also determined all the way down. Well, you certainly, you know, all of us, uh, none of us chose our genes. That may change. Um, <laughs> uh, right. um, we certainly didn't get to choose our parents. Um, and there is absolutely no question that the development of our nervous system is very strongly influenced by the environment in which we grow up in, the first 18 months of life, and all these other sorts of things. But to conclude from that, that we lack independent agency, that, uh, that, that personal judgment is inauthentic, um, I think belies in the face of both logic and experience. And towards the end of Sam's book, the last three pages, um, I, I think, are absolutely hilarious. And the reason for that is as he brings the book to a conclusion, yeah. he realizes that he has to explain why he's ending the book now. <laughs> um, and he basically can't explain it. And he said, I don't know why I'm ending this now. Um, any more than I know why I would rather have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. 
I don't make up my mind, my mind makes me up. Right. Um, and that, that, that's a nice turn of phrase, which I like very much. Mm. But then in the end, he said, I can do anything I want. If I choose to use the word elephant on this page, I may. And of course, in so <laughs> saying, he just that did. did yeah. um, <laughs> and then he, he ends the book with what I would gar regard as the greatest denouement uh, in nonfiction I've ever read, which is, I'm hungry now and I'm going to go have something to eat. And that's how the book ends. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I think even Sam is aware yeah. of the paradox of arguing against free will and yet explaining why you feel the need to. The odd thing about, uh, I know Sam pretty well and, and, and he and I are good friends, but the, the idea that uh, he, he's always saying, we don't know where our next thought is coming from. This is a guy who can meditate for 18 straight hours just thinking about his thoughts. And it's like, Sam, if you don't know where your thoughts are coming from, then nobody does. <laughs> but isn't this the whole point of meditation is to track your thoughts and where they go? Uh, anyway, that's, that's sort of a sidebar. I, I do like to quote, which I did to him, and, and, and I've written this a study done in 2009, a survey of professional philosophers. There's like 3,600 PhDs, grad students, professors, and so on, who do this for a living. And the survey was, you know, what is your opinion of these 27 different issues in philosophy? And uh, now this is, this is not quite the same thing as scientific consensus. But, it, it, but on the free will question, there was, you know, libertarian free will, there's a ghost in the machine. Almost no one believes that. That was a low single digit number. And then compatibilism was the majority, like 60%. Right. Uh, which is what you and I are, I think. And Dan Dennett is as well. And then it was, the, then the, the next number is like 29% or whatever was uh, determinists. And, and now that counts for whatever, nothing in terms of what the truth is. But on the other hand, this idea that if you just thought it through carefully enough, you'd be a determinist. It's like, wait, wait, you're saying that, you know, 60%, you know, 60 of professional philosophers, all they do for a living. These are the best, you know, Dan Dennett, he's one of the greatest thinkers of our time, written books about, he just hasn't thought it through. Maybe the, the problem is the words we use, you know, determinism can't also allow free will. Free will, agency, we use these active verbs, something's going on. And I think here it's one of these Mysterian things. We're just concept, we're conceiving it in a way it can never be resolved in, in any kind of scientific sense. I agree. And I, and I would add something to that because um, uh, I, I quoted Dennett in my chapter on free will. Of course, he's written a, a very provocative book called Freedom Evolves. Yeah. It's a difficult book, but I think it's well worth reading. Um, <clears throat> but one of the observations he makes towards the beginning of that book is that for many people, one of the greatest obstacles in accepting evolution is the belief that evolution somehow rules out free will because it's an entirely materialistic explanation not right. just of where we came from but how we operate right. and the point that i wanted to make um and as you know because you because you read the book carefully um i do not say here is the locus of free will you know i don't i don't don't point to a particular place and say right. there's a little man there doing this or that or the other thing um i'm compatibilist but i leave open the question um as to whether or not we can resolve this but what i tried to point out at the end is that evolution is not the enemy of free will. Because if we truly do have free will, it was evolution that gave it to us. Even if it's an illusion? Well, yeah. there, there's, there's, there's an interesting turn of phrase here, and I stole this from another author, and I'm trying to remember who I stole it from. But one explanation for the illusion of free will is the idea that the, the illusion of free will was beneficial in evolution because it created a sense of responsibility for our own actions, mm. which was useful to social cohesion and forming human groups that eventually enabled us to become the dominant primate on this planet. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that if free will is an illusion, it is an illusion that became self-fulfilling yeah, 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 because it was yeah. favored by evolution. Yeah, yeah, and agree. that's what I mean, that yeah. evolution is not the enemy of free will. I like this idea of useful fictions. You know, I mean, quantum physicists say, well, this is all empty space. Yeah, yeah but it's, a, it's, it's an illusion of hardness because it's not really empty if they look at the atoms at a different scale. Or the illusion of the self. Yeah, okay, there's no structure in the brain where the self is located. Yeah, but, but as, a, as a sort of unified whole, it, it feels like I'm me and, and you're not. And, and that's good enough for, in terms of functioning. Yeah, and, and I'll put that another way in terms of you know, the, the delocalization of the self. Um, one of the, the questions that Thomas Nagel asks, um, the, uh, the author, not just the, what is it like to be a bat, which is a wonderful five-page essay that everybody should read and ponder, but also a more recent book called uh, uh, Mind and Cosmos. And the subtitle, Mind and Cosmos, caught my eye immediately, which is why the neo-Darwinian right. theory of evolution is almost certainly wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I saw that it says, what? 
<laughs> and when you read Nagel's book, which is an extraordinary book, only 120 pages, but he's a philosopher, and those are a dense 120 pages. Um, the, 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 his argument turns out not to be with evolution, but with neuroscience. And he basically argues that consciousness is inexplicable in material terms. And because evolution purports to explain not just our origins, but our functions in material terms, and evolution has not yet explained consciousness, therefore the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution must not mm. be true. Mm. Now, um, I wrote a review of that for the journal Commonweal, uh, in which I was I praised Nagel's attention to the problem of consciousness. It is a serious issue, you gotta think about this. But also criticized what I regarded his pessimism about where science would go. And I made an analogy to Erwin Schrodinger's great book from the 1940s, What is Life? And in that book, What, what is Life? Schrodinger puzzled over the question of heredity. What was the chemical nature of the gene? And he said, basically, we're not gonna be able to explain the nature of the gene by ordinary physics and chemistry, we should expect new laws of physics mm. to apply to the propagation of the gene. Mm. That's almost what Nagel is saying with respect to consciousness. Well, right. it turns out, after Watson and Crick published their work, based on Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction pattern in 1953, all of a sudden people realize, wait a minute, we don't we need new laws of physics or chemistry to explain the chemical nature of the gene. Right. We just have to understand that chemical compounds are capable of much more than we ever thought. Right. And as soon, Rosalind Franklin, for example, as soon as she saw the double helix model, her reaction was, it's so beautiful, it just has to be true. <laughs> but prior to that time, there was no real explanation as to how this could work. There's no new chemistry or physics in DNA. Right. There's a new capability, in effect, a hierarchy that's built up that explains this. And I'm absolutely convinced um, I'm more optimistic about explaining consciousness than you are. I'm absolutely convinced that that will happen with consciousness as well. I like the way you put it, that, con that, that consciousness, is, matter is not conscious, but consciousness is something matter can do. It's an, act, an active verb yes. rather than... Yeah, because one of the questions Nagel asks is, how is it that the same carbon atom at the tip of my pencil, which is clearly inanimate, can go become part of my brain and suddenly it's conscious? Is there a difference between conscious matter and unconscious matter? And the point I tried to make, which you generously pointed out, is matter does not, consciousness is not something that matter is. There's no individual atom or molecule which is conscious. Rather, consciousness is something that matter does. So it's a process. And I would say the right. same thing about life. Um, the candy bar I ate on the plane coming out to LA today had a lot of carbon atoms in it, <laughs> more than I really needed. Um, <laughs> but some of those carbon atoms are now alive because they are in me. And have they changed their chemical nature at all? No, of course not. They are still carbon because they become part of not a living carbon atom, but they become part of a chemical process which we call life. So would you say that's also the explanation for the meaning or purpose of life? It's, it's not built into it, it's just something we do. It's I, something I, matter does. I, I would say, first of all, that, that meaning and purpose are human creations, Yeah. Uh, just like beauty. And the meaning and purpose of things is something that we assigned. Uh, we may assign it simply because of our great big brains uh, that are basically creating these values and also always getting us into trouble. I don't know how many of you have read Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut, but every now and then, uh, alluding to that wonderful novel, when I do something really stupid, um, I say, thank you, big brain. Um, <laughs> right. And that, that's a recurring line in Vonnegut's novel, that big brains are always getting us into trouble. But I think these big brains are also where meaning and purpose come from. Right. And, and you know, if the, 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 I don't know how you're gonna direct our conversation, but let me push it in one direction, you'll yeah, know okay. if you wanna go All there. Right. Um, and that is whether the emergence of the human species on this planet matters. In other words, whether or not our very existence is significant or not. Okay. And, and that matters based, to whom? Well, uh, <laughs> whether it matters to the universe. Okay. Okay. Now that's, that's a rather grand thing to say. Okay. And let's um, go. A there. number a number <laughs> of people who have read my book said, "Oh, you're into a kind of chest thumping triumphalism." We humans, were the pinnacle of creation, right, we're the right. ultimate, we own this planet, we can do anything we want with it, so forth. And I mean exactly the opposite. Right, yeah. And the way it began the last chapter of the book, um, and I was, as you know, because you're, you're a prolific writer and, and a really excellent one, is when you're trying to put the last chapter of the book together, you want to sum things up. 
and you want to give the reader a take-home message, and you want to basically reward them for the chore of having gone all the way through your book, saying, I have a final thesis to present to you. And I wasn't quite sure. I always have, uh, once I can begin a chapter, I know how to end it. But for me, the beginning is the hard part, to get it just right. And it was August two years ago. And my own children, my own girls will testify to this. Even though I'm a biologist, I'm a stargazing nut. <laughs> and uh, when my girls were little, I would wake them up at 3 a.m. to watch a lunar eclipse. I would drag them out in the winter or the summer to watch a meteor shower. Uh, and I still remember the first time I dragged Lauren, my oldest, who's now a wildlife biologist, out to watch the Perseid meteor shower in August. It was about 3 a.m. And I had chairs out there, and I dragged both the girls out and laid them down in the lounge chairs, uh, sprayed insect repellent all over them, necessary where I live, <laughs> um, and laid back. And unfortunately, for 10 or 15 minutes, there was nothing. And Lauren was saying, oh, and then there was a little bitty one. And she goes, Dad, that's what you brought us out for. And before she finished the sentence, there was a, a, just a searing fi line of uh, fire that cut from horizon to horizon. And as she was saying, is that... And then she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> and ever since then, she's loved to go out and do this All sort right. of thing. So I'm puzzling over how to start the chapter. And I realized from my calendar, oh, tomorrow night's the Perseids. And then I thought, I know how to explain what I mean about human significance. And the way I began the chapter is by saying, I'm hoping for a clear sky tomorrow night. And the reason for that is it's expected to be the peak of the annual Perseid meteor shower. And I'm going to lie out in my backyard because my daughters are grown and moved away, pretty much by myself. But on this planet, I will not be alone. I will be joined by tens of thousands of strangers who share the same obsession with things astronomical that I do. And they will lie back in darkness, and they will glory in these streaks of sudden fire that come across the sky. So what makes humans special? Of all the species on this planet, we're the only ones who know the Perseids are coming. <laughs> right. We're the only ones who would lie out in delight at the Perseids. We're the only ones who seek answers to questions in the stars. And that makes our existence as self-conscious matter a point of significance to the universe. And my two scientific heroes in this respect, um, and I do a point-counterpoint uh, against people like Henry Gee, who wrote a book called The Accidental Species, saying we're not that big a deal, we don't possess any particular qualities that no, any other animal possesses. We shouldn't make too much of ourselves. Our significance doesn't really matter. In this respect, my two scientific heroes in opposition are, first of all, Jacob Bronowski. Mm -hmm. And those of you of a certain age may remember um, a TV series in a book called The Ascent of Man. Um, uh, today it would be this, The Ascent of Humans. Um, but the other thing is an awful lot of biologists would, gee, like Guy would argue there is no ascent. You know, right. we're not up there or anything else. But Bronowski would have absolutely none of that. Right. And he wrote things like, man is a singular creature. We are the creature who, may, who did not find but made his home in every corner of the earth. And he talked about studies of animal behavior by the likes of Conrad Lorenz. And he mentioned the fact that Lorenz basically learns about animal behavior and then applies that to humans and says humans aren't really different from animals. But Bronowski then says there must be something different about humans because otherwise the ducks would be writing papers about Lorenz <laughs> right. rather than Lorenz writing papers about ducks. Right. And then finally, my, my true scientific hero, and again, neither is your people of faith. My true scientific hero is the, the, the late Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan. And I'm very proud to say that Carl Sagan is a graduate of Rawway High School in Rawway, New Jersey. Right. That's where I went to school as well. Uh, <laughs> Never met the guy, although he did take my Aunt Doris to the senior prom. And I've heard, this is a true story, by the way, um, and I've heard a little bit about him from, 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 from Doris. And Sagan basically says, we human beings are significant to the cosmos because we are a part of the cosmos that has become self-conscious and aware and has enabled for the first time, insofar as we know, for the cosmos to begin exploring itself. And that, yep. to me, is, is, is the perfect way to describe what is unique and special about our species. Right. So what do we need religion for? <laughs> okay. Um, the, um, well, uh, we can do this if you like. And, and 
and I was I was telling a few well, because people. Well, that's the, that's the answer religion always gave in some way. Okay, uh, well, uh, no, I'll, I'll answer yeah, your question. Okay, right. So I, I was talking to a few people right before our gathering began, and I pointed out I'm going from one polar extreme to the other because yesterday I did a Facebook Live interview for BioLogos. Oh, oh boy. The okay, organization right, founded right, by Francis Collins. Right. And now I'm going across the coast <laughs> to talk to the, the skeptics. skeptics. Okay. <laughs> um, and the, the way I would put it is, is this, and that is, um, as a scientist and as, as a human being, I simply do not find nature to be self-explanatory. And what I mean by that is the notion that the universe, that existence itself, that the unreasonable efficacy of mathematics, that the fact that the universe is understandable, that all of these things are self-explanatory. And I believe in a position that goes back to Greek philosophers, that something outside the universe is required to explain it. Now, um, as you know, um, our good friend, because he's my friend too, Lawrence Krauss, uh, a few, and Lawrence and I have made common cause in many, many places, including Ohio, fighting against creationists. He's a good buddy, and I really like Lawrence. Um, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called A Universe from Nothing. Mm -hmm. And in A Universe from Nothing, he pointed out quite correctly that modern physics explains the way in which matter and energy can arise literally out of nothing. That a pure vacuum, in other words, a space with nothing in it, is unstable, and matter arises out of it. Mm -hmm. And whole universes can arise exactly the same way. And therefore, he concludes, the, <coughs> the theologians, trump card, as he called it, which is why is there something rather than nothing, yeah. has now been answered. Yeah. We know that universes and matter can arise from nothing. Now, the interesting thing about that thesis, and Dawkins wrote an enthusiastic yeah. afterward to the book, as you know. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about that is the most severe critics of that have been people, not people of faith, but rather uh, people who, yep. who identify as that. atheists. Yeah. And in particular, uh, David Alpert, a philosophy professor at Columbia University, in his review in the New York Times, basically, unfortunately, tore Larry a new one. Um, <laughs> and what he pointed out was that when you say a universe can arise from nothing, that presupposes the existence of quantum fields and fluctuations and an entire set mm -hmm. of physical laws that make this possible. Where did those come mm -hmm. from? Mm -hmm. So you yep. really haven't answered the question. Right. And Lawrence, um, who has a bit of a temper, um, went into an internet rave about philosophy and basically said, what have we ever learned from philosophers? Right. You know, the last 2,000 years, progress has come from science. Philosophy is nonsense. Why should I listen for what philosophy professor David Albert has to say about this? And what he neglected to do is to Google David Albert, and he then would discover that he has a PhD in physics. Oh, right. Um, and therefore, right. he knew exactly what he was talking about. So that ultimate explanation of why is there something rather than nothing? Why is the universe interpretable and understandable? I'm not sure that's a question that science can answer. And in that respect, I agree with what you wrote in that forthcoming Scientific American issue, was to put God as an unanswerable question, a God who dabbles in nature, a God who is just sort of a, a being who does cool, magical stuff would be detectable. Right. But in the tradition, in, in, in the Catholic tradition in which I am raised, God is not part of nature. God is the reason for nature. Okay. And that's why he should remain undetectable. Okay. <laughs> wow. Well, I do. I do I, hey, hey, you opened the door, buddy. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it's all good. But, uh, but, but you, you adhere to a particular faith, Catholicism, sure. uh, versus, say, Judaism. I was just on Ben Shapiro's show. Uh, last week, and, and, and so why don't you accept the resurrection as Jesus is the Messiah? And he had a long explanation of that. We, the Old Testament doesn't say Messiah in the way the Christians, and he went on. And, yes, that, uh, that, that's uh, true, by the yeah. way. Yeah, okay. okay, all right, all right. Uh, but in other words, like when I debate um, uh, theologians who argue in favor of the resurrection, they have their six arguments or ten arguments of why it's true. Well, if the arguments were so good, it, then why don't Jews accept it? Because they believe even in the same God that you accept, and they still reject uh, so there's something else, extra evidentiary, that, that has nothing to do with epistemology and what's the right reason or set of arguments or evidence that you just either make the leap or you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. I'll, I'm going to start out flippant, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, at one point, Bertrand Russell, 
great philosopher, um, was jailed briefly in Great Britain. I, I forget what for. Maybe it, was anti, it was against the First World War. I yeah, think. his opposition to the war and yeah. so forth. And the uh, jailer on the intake papers had to take down his vitals. Where do you live? Where are you from? <laughs> and then there was a blank for religion. And uh, they asked him, what's your religion? He said, agnostic. And the jailer is reported to have said, well, I've never heard of that. There are many religions, but I suppose we all worship the same God. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and Russell said that kept him laughing the whole, the whole time he was in jail. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, there, there, there is, you know, one of the things about science that I think makes science unique and valuable is that there is on this planet a single scientific culture. And science is the closest thing we have on this planet to a universal culture. And what I mean by that, basically, is if you and I were to discuss art, politics, philosophy, and then we were to go to uh, a university in an East Asian tradition and talk about art, politics, and so forth, we'd be completely out of our element. There'd be a completely different cultural way to understand the interrelationships between these various fields and so forth. But on the other hand, if I was to go to a cell biology conference in my field, uh, whether it was in China or Japan or Indonesia or Kenya, we'd all speak the same language. Um, that doesn't mean all scientists agree, but it does mean that science being empirical um, basically um, has a, a, common, a, a common understanding of how we test ideas and how we generate theories and how we test hypotheses. Religious faith, by definition, is supernatural. It, it transcends the, the natural. Right, right. And I'm perfectly willing to admit that there are things that are beyond our understanding, these ultimate questions as to why are we here. Um, is, is there a sense of right and wrong? Why does the universe <coughs> exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? And I think there are many ways to answer those. Um, and I would not claim for a second to have uh, a hammer lock on the truth in terms of saying, I can tell you, uh, yep. I'm a Roman Catholic and I can tell you why you should be too. <laughs> um, uh, for me, it is the faith tradition I understand. It's a tradition, uh, with the exception of that Galileo speed bump, it's a, <laughs> it's yeah. a tradition especially in recent times, which has been quite amenable and hospitable and supportive of science, um, which mm -hmm. makes me feel very much at home. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to my own needs for understanding. Um, I you know, fully accept um, that there are other religious traditions. I don't think we all worship the same God, but I think we're all grappling towards the same question. And to me, that, that's the unifying aspect of religion. One of my favorite lines from Woody Allen was when he talked about his first divorce that uh, he, his wife was an atheist and he was an agnostic and they couldn't agree on which schools or which religions not to not raise to. the children in yet. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. It would be curious to know if we came back 500 years from now after being cryonically frozen or some such thing, or if we had brains say twice the size of ours. We'd go, oh, it's so obvious. We couldn't have seen it, but now we can see the free will consciousness, whatever. So, and we just are limited based on mm -hmm. our brain size. Yeah, or, well, it's nice to think about, but unfortunately, the paleontological evidence is that the human brain is getting smaller. Oh. Um, that in the last. Oh, that's right. It kind of peaked and then. Yeah, down it kind of bit. peaked and it's sort of tapering off. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, brain size is not the story. Right. That's right. Um, you know, yeah, that's that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's right. very important to appreciate. Right. right. Um, you know, there's a. Uh, um, um, the, when Albert Einstein passed away, there were a lot of people who wanted to analyze his brain because right, they were right. convinced it must be and very did, large. Yeah. It's slightly smaller than normal. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it had extra glial cells. So it was I have no idea. Super clean. It was a super clean brain. <laughs> well, before we turn it over to the, the audience, I thought I'd ask Don and, and, and Ed if they wanted to make any comments about some of the stuff. Well, uh, going way back about oh, the middle hey, of your discussion. Hang on. There, use, uh, this, use this. Use this. Use the microphone. Sorry. Yeah for recording purposes. Are we on here? Yeah, it's on. Uh, going back to the, the middle of the discussion, we were talking about determinism, and I'm just reminded of uh, things that my friend Steve Gould said a lot in his life, which is the issue of contingency and how much there is so much that we do not have any way to anticipate, and no organism can anticipate, mm -hmm. uh, and things that are you know, random speed bumps from meteorites in space to just you know, things that happen that are not part of the biologic system at all that makes life and everything about it very unpredictable, which is also a very serious issue for a very hard form of determinism. Uh, you know, that we can't really think that, you know, as, as you were pointing out, Stephen Hawking said, you know, if we could predict it all from the beginning to the end, but the, the, that whole point that Gould made over contingency is that not even life is predictable. If you ran the tape of life again and again and again, you'd always get a different result 
because there are so many accidents and things that have no, you know, even well-adapted dinosaurs still died out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I, um, you know, I, I actually talked with Steve about that point, and I agree with him completely um, in terms of the general sense of unpredictability. And in one of my books, I brought up a really, uh, I think, relevant example of historical contingency uh, in, in, in U.S. history, um, which is that one night in 1944, um, the, uh, the uh, pat uh, patrol torpedo boat PT-109 <laughs> was cruising at night, and the skipper should have been at the helm, um, but it was rather warm, and he wanted to smoke a cigarette. So uh, se uh, uh, Second Lieutenant John F. Kennedy was lying out on the bow of the ship at the moment that it was cut in half by the Japanese destroyer Amagiri. Yeah. And because he was not at the helm, he lived. Mm -hmm. um, and not only did he live to become President <laughs> of the United States, but being a champion swimmer from his time in college, he saved the lives of several of his crew members. Um, and again, all that JFK had to do was to be a few meters to one side, and none of that, <laughs> none of that would have happened. And as, as Gould liked to say, maybe this time, um, the, the meteor that ended the Cretaceous misses the Earth by a few hundred kilometers. Dinosaurs are not driven extinct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mammals remain these little furry bur burrowing things, yeah. eating up, feeding on scraps, um, and primates themselves. And of course, we never come into existence. That's, right. That's how close things could be in terms of unpredictability. Do well, thank you for a great conversation. I want to go back to the very beginning where you started, uh, because being the doing all my doing so much work in the history of the creation evolution legal controversy, uh, I wish I had your optimism about where we're going and if we're making progress. You talked about the Dover case, and you were able to give a few examples of where it helped. And it did help isolate it here and there. Right. But the problem was it was a district court decision, never got appealed, and therefore never had the precedential effect that we eventually got with, say, the uh, decision overturning the uh, Arkansas anti-evolution law in uh, 1968, or the one overturning the equal time law out of Louisiana, or actually um, at, in a related case, earlier, but Arkansas, but Louisiana was the final yeah, one. Yeah, those are Emerson those are versus Arkansas uh, and Edwards versus, versus Aguilar. Yeah. So those had, had somewhat lasting effects, but I'll get to, I'll get to the somewhat part <laughs> later. The problem with what happened in Dover is, even though you made a brilliant job and the decision by the judge was brilliant, and that carried some persuasive effects, we see all over the country that, um, uh, that intelligent design is continuing to make inroads. We see it inroads in public schools. It's happening all over the place. Um, we also see it making inroads around the world, and of course we see it in uh, uh, parochial schools, which with vouchers to becoming more popular, that's spreading. So we've got that issue, but we also have a very tenuous Supreme Court. If Justice Kennedy steps down next month, then there'll be another appointment, and right now there are at least three and maybe four justices, and that would make five, who would rule otherwise on the Dover case. We also have states like Tennessee and other states, Louisiana, and many other states considering so-called academic freedom mm -hmm. statutes, which have never even been challenged by the National Center for Science Education because they feared they'd lose with the current constituency of the courts, which, depending on how they're written, some of them mandate that students be taught, as you uh, alluded to, taught about that it's only a theory and there are good reasons to question uh, evolution, just as there are good reasons to question climate change. And those, those statutes have a great chance of, of spreading, being adopted in more states. We've got a secretary of education who is a creationist. We, uh, just like we have a head of the Environmental Protection Agency who doesn't believe in climate change. But it's not just here. I just got back from speaking at a conference in uh, Singapore, which is a country that, is, that accepts evolution and is on the cutting edge of much genetic research. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, was a, it was a conference on the worldwide spread of creationism because it's sandwiched between Indonesia and Malaysia, both of which now ban the teaching of evolution, as do every Islamic country in the world. You mentioned Turkey going mm -hmm. that way. We also see countries 
like Hungary and Poland, where there's increased resistance, and even, even Russia now, increased resistance to the teaching of evolution. Um, South America, there are incredible problems. North, uh, South Korea uh, there is, is, has become a creationist country where intelligent design is strong, as do many of the islands of the Pacific. So this is not an area that we can um, rest comfortably about, and we have to watch this with every election in our own country at local levels, but also at the national level. So that's one comment that I wanted to expand on and what you were talking about. While Dover was wonderful, it was, I fear, a very weak breakwater. I'll agree with you 100%. And, and one of the things that I mentioned is when Michael suggested maybe this is all over, no, it's popping up all over the place. I mentioned specifically Arizona. Um, I can name a dozen other states in which these measures have come close to passage. And there is indeed a political climate now that's running against science in general, um, in every respect. Uh, there's a strong tide of anti-intellectualism in this country and in many others. Um, I spoke uh, about five years ago at the Tree of Evolution Conference in Turkey hmm. at, uh, at METU, which is the Middle Eastern Technical University, which is um, sort of the MIT of the Middle East. I'm not making that up. It's an extraordinary university with wonderful people. Um, they, all the students, by the way, want to go to graduate school in the United States, trust me. And I'm sure that, I'm sure that is still true. Um, but they felt, these are, these are Turkish students and Turkish professors, and they felt under fire from the Islamist tide. And they're all, they're all Islam, they're all Muslims. But they, they nonetheless felt under fire from the fundamentalist tide in their own country. Um, to paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, um, eternal vigilance is the price <laughs> of scientific integrity. Yep. And I think we have to fight for that all the time. Um, I was uh, just elected uh, president of the board of the National Center for Science Education. And we are uh -huh. going to be doing everything we can <laughs> to fight for science in these places. But I, wanna, uh, I, I once overheard my wife describing me to someone else. She didn't know I was listening. <laughs> describing me as a pathological optimist. <laughs> and, 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 and I will confess that's probably true. But one of the things I'd point out is that Gallup has been doing polling on acceptance of a number of statements for, for 25 or 30 years. And the statement that reflects creationism is, do you believe that human beings were created in pretty much their present form within the last 10,000 years? The percentage of Americans saying yes to that is now at its lowest point in the last 30 years. And what that tells me is that the efforts of organizations like the National Center for Science Education, of people like you, and also of scientists around the country, um, has been paying off to some extent. I don't mean, hey, put our feet up on the desk and everything's cool. Um, and I'll give you one example. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned, I'm the author of high school textbooks that are used all over the country. Um, the state of Florida is currently in the middle of a science textbook adoption. So my publisher sent me down to speak at the Florida State Science Teachers <laughs> Meetings, autograph books, you know, do all take key teachers out to dinner, tell them why we got the best book and all this other sort of stuff. <laughs> and, and our book is, is really well known for having the strongest treatment of evolution of any of the books. And that's, that's more credit to my co-author, Joel Levine, who writes those sections that I am. He's passionate about making evolution the central organizing principle of biology, which it is. I think many of you may remember that on April 22nd, Last year and this year, there were marches for science all around the country. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. There is a teacher, uh, got it, in Volusia County named Brandon Haught. I think it's Brandon Haught, okay. Um, he is president of Florida Citizens for Science. He's been fighting this creationist tide all throughout Florida. Um, the State Board of Education held hearings on anti-evolution measures, and the legislature held hearings on these two weeks after this state, this March for Science. And there were big marches for science, scientists in, in Tampa and in Miami and in Tallahassee, and everybody demonstrated had a really, really good time. As he pointed out in an op-ed piece in the journal Nature, high school teacher getting a whole page in Nature, very impressive. <laughs> yeah. As he pointed out in an op-ed piece in Nature, there wasn't a single one of those university scientists who showed up to testify in front of the legislature when it really mattered. Wow. And the editorial was, where the hell yeah. are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, and this is, uh, this is the gospel I preach to my own colleagues in the scientific community, we can't be missing in action 
when these measures come up in front of state legislatures, local school boards, curriculum committees, anywhere. If we want to continue to be part of the most vibrant scientific community in the world, we have to make damn sure it's not cut off at its roots. And its roots are in public education. And therefore, just like, just like you, I feel this is a battle we have to keep fighting. Thanks. Questions or comments? From the gallery there, yes. Go ahead, yep. Oh, okay. Hi. Oh, I've got so many questions, I have to figure out which one. Um, back to free will. Yeah. Um, I've done some reading and been very interested in the subject for a while, and I've, I've kind of concluded that part of the, the disagreements among philosophers is um, semantic to some extent. Um, and I, I just don't find that people define uh, free will before they start talking about it, because um, are, you, are you familiar with Galen Strasser? Yes, I am. Yeah, and he has a certain way of looking at free right. will, which happens to be the way I look at it, but it's defined in terms of uh, back to the idea that the fact that you couldn't choose anything about your genes and your environment, da, 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 and that everything else follows through, that you in fact don't have you know, real free will, but you have agency which is a different thing. Indeed. And like Daniel Dennett talks about agency, but then he'll argue with people who are talking about this kind of free will. And it just always <laughs> surprised me that they, they weren't resolving things by just defining what free will is. Um, that, that, was, that was one thing. Um, let, let me react to that quickly okay. before you go to the next thing, which is one should not be surprised to see philosophers debating the meaning of words. Um, <laughs> that is their data. Because, because and that's okay, as long as they define it. It is. And, and I think the most difficult thing about free will and consciousness is every single one of us thinks we know what it is. Because every single one of us experiences it in one sense or another. We experience our own consciousness. It's so intimate to us. It's much easier to talk about um, what generates the light coming out of there in physical and chemical terms than it is to sort of go inside and ask the brain to figure itself out, which is by definition an inaccessible object. But uh, Michael made exactly the same point with respect to consciousness, which is what are we actually talking about? This is a key, and I think, you know, you share the confusion that, that I have as well when reading different definitions of this by arguing viewpoints. Yeah. Right, and I just am surprised that sometimes yeah. I see them. Yeah, like Sam Harris had a completely, I, I read that little pamphlet, and he had a whole different idea about oh, what free will was. And as a biologist, I, I understood that, but that wasn't even the one that I was interested in. You know, and I was, you know, I know what Sam Harris was saying. Um, I'm not a fan of his, but, um, <laughs> um, but I do understand the point that um, if you do, there is something to be said that if, if you do accept the lack of free will, um, it is something that allows you to be less judgmental to some extent. Um, and it, I think that <coughs> once you assume that everyone has um, responsibility for every action, um, you have a very different way of punishing for wrongdoing, et cetera. So I do understand that logic. The other question I had was I was always confused why um, people, and this was related to the whole idea of stochastic events, um, why you couldn't not believe in free will and also say you don't, determinism isn't true. Um, they don't seem to have that combination as much. You know, you, you can say free will doesn't exist, but that doesn't require that you believe in determinism. And somehow that seems often assumed. Yeah, well, I, I, I it, you know, as, as everyone in this room knows, um, physics in the last decade of the 19th century thought it had everything figured out. Um, that we lived in a kind of pinball universe um, where you had collisions between atoms and even subatomic particles and these collisions were as predictable as billiard balls rolling around on a table and therefore the universe was strictly deterministic. And with the discovery of the quantum and particular and radioactivity and quantum indeterminacy, it was absolutely apparent that the future state of the universe, or any system, is not entirely predictable, even if you knew every parameter of the present state. So that is what is meant by quantum level indeterminacy. And 
Um, one of the arguments I made in Finding Darwin's God is that if we lived in a strictly deterministic 19th century kind of universe, you could never make an argument for free will. Because every single thing that happened would be predetermined by previous conditions. I didn't claim to say that quantum indeterminacy gives us free will. But the very fact that the future states of complex systems are not entirely predictable from previous states, that makes room for free will to exist. In other words, if that was not true, it could not exist. I don't think. Yeah. The, 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 other thing, the other thing with respect to free will is I think Harris's definition of free will basically is that you have absolute freedom to do something entirely independent of every influence on you, every aspect of your genes, your upbringing, everything else. Nobody believes in that. Nobody argues in that. Um, if, if we were to walk down the street and find a wallet there um, and it had $500 in it in cash, and I'm a pretty well-off guy, and I got royalties, and I got a bank account. You know what I'm going to do, probably, is I'm going to get the ID. I'm not going to take a dime out of it, and I'm going to call that person up. Now, I'm not claiming that means I'm a good person. But let's suppose I was, absolute, I was about to be evicted from my house. I needed $200 immediately for the next week's rent. I need another 50 bucks to feed my kids who are home screaming. I'm going to keep that money, OK? And you know, it's sort of like a Jean Beljean Jean Valjean decision ba based, on, based on situation. So um, I, I do think our behavior is strongly influenced, of course, by influences around us in previous conditions and so forth. So I don't think asserting a kind of agency, and I think agency is a better word than free will, a kind of agency to take that in, reason about it, and come to a decision freely, um, I don't think um, I don't think that's. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that could be ruled out by what we know about neuroscience. Right. But then, as as, as um, Michael said, there's also that what whatever you, method you use to come to the, your conclusion was also not something you freely chose. There so you your ability to make any decision is based on a whole lot of other things that you didn't choose. Yeah, we'll be we'll be arguing about words very quickly. <laughs> one, one last thing. Sure. Is, it, is there any to get the word theory out of the theory of evolution. <laughs> uh, um, I hope not, and I'll explain why, but go ahead. Well, there could be another word. I mean, you know, it's just that it's so misunderstood in, 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 you know, <laughs> among uh, lay people. They, they miss, miss. Yeah, no, there, there's no question that people, you know, speak like. Because in you, my opinion, it, you know, I, I'm happy calling it a fact at this point. Okay, well, I would put it a different way. Yeah. And that, that is, uh, uh, I, I work very hard to argue that theory is a much higher level of understanding than fact. And what I mean by fact, yeah, and, and, and what I mean by fact is, here is this particular cell that has this structure. This cell has two flagella on it. Um, this cell has a certain degree of heterochromatin. Each of these are facts, and by facts I mean a repeatable, verifiable, experimental observation. That's what a fact is. What's a theory? A theory is, is a level of understanding that unifies thousands or millions of observable, verifiable facts into an explanatory framework. Theories never become facts. Theories explain facts. And that's the way in which I would put it. That's nicely put. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. It's just wonderful <laughs> to be here today. Um, when I think about, uh, you mentioned things like mathematics and the ability to write a symphony. And when I think about that, I think both the emergence of language, the use of symbols, the fact that we can acquire knowledge and pass it on to the next generation. When I started with clapping, it took a few generations to get to symphonies. So, and that's what makes us special, is the fact that we have language, that we can record things, next generation gets to step up and off from the point of the previous gener generations provided information. So if we put an opposable thumb on a dolphin, then Gave him an internet connection. On him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the dolphin is going to say, this, this thumb is slowing me down. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I don't want this at all. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just wondering what you're thinking on that. Because for me, it's, I'm making it as simple as it's just the accumulation of knowledge and language that makes us very different. Well, um, you, one can argue that there are lots of other animals that, first of all, have language in the sense, uh, in the sense of ability to communicate. Um, the, uh, when I was a grad student at the University of Colorado, I lived in a dorm that was about a mile from the main campus. And there was a large undeveloped area, perhaps 10 or 15 acres. And there was a, a walkway that walked through it. So I had to hike, I didn't have a car. So I had to hike all the way to campus. 
all around that walkway was a prairie dog colony. And anybody who's ever interacted with prairie dogs is going to know exactly what I'm talking about, which is there would be sentinel prairie dogs standing up at the edge of the colony. And at a very precise distance, I'd say it was about 35 meters, the sentinels closest to me would start going chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> the pitch of the chirps would increase as I kept walking <laughs> until finally when I get 10 meters away, they disappear into the hole and other sentinels a little farther out of the colony would pop up and they would start chirping. Um, they were communicating to the entire group underground where the stranger was by virtue of sort of cascading chirps as you walk. It was just fascinating to see. That's a kind of language. That's the ability to communicate. But they can't, they can't write that down. They can't pass it on to the next generation. That gave us our acceleration here to get to sense. That's exactly right. And the, other, and the other thing is they're not busy analyzing human society by looking at who's living in all those high rises and why are there multiple floors and you know, what do these individuals mean. We are, we are the, the creatures who have taken upon ourselves to analyze not only ourselves, but to analyze and systematize other forms of life. And that, again, is absolutely unique to humans. You approach uh, evolutionary psych in your book cautiously. Uh, people like uh -huh. Jeffrey Miller argue that things like music or poetry uh, and, and the arts uh, and so on are, are a way of expressing your genetic viability, so females are selecting males in a sexual selection. I'm going to put it a little this. more crudely. Okay. Uh, what Jeffrey <laughs> says is that music and art is a good way to get laid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, yeah, that's... that's <laughs> and I'll go further. Um, he says, for example, comedy, telling jokes, yeah. right, serves right. the same sexual selective function. And are you ready for this? Yeah. That's why men are funnier than women. Right. <laughs> That's why there are no good female yeah. comics, he said. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know about you, but my hackles get up uh -huh. when I hear some nonsense like that. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and one of the people I specifically talked about, uh, and I did mention Jeffrey Miller, and Jeffrey Miller had this you know, very unfortunate interaction with a potential grad student whom he said that he didn't want to take her into, her, into his lab because she was fat. And if she did not have the willpower to control her own oh, appetite and oh habits, boy. she obviously wouldn't make a good scientist. Wow. And really? It, this know, is a true story? Oh, I didn't it's know It's in the this. book. Oh, okay. Read, okay, read right. more carefully. All right. Um, but but uh, uh, Dennis Dutton, in his book, The Art Instinct, right. says pretty much the same thing. Right. So he says, basically, art is largely made by men. And again, he's explaining this in terms of sexual attractiveness and so <laughs> forth. Um, and he's also saying that our, our tastes in art were shaped during the Pleistocene. And he imagines in the Pleistocene this stereotype that men were hunters and out there you know, fighting the beasts and bringing in the meat. And the women were back home, I guess, sweeping out the cave <laughs> and tending and taking care of the kids. Well, the fact of the matter is we know almost nothing about the social structure of human right. society during the Pleistocene. So right. don't give me this, the guys were hunters and the, women's were tending, the women were tending the hardest nonsense and so forth. But Dutton basically, making this argument for art says, tastes in art favor drawings that are pastoral, that show water, animals, right. small children, and pretty landscapes. Right. And that's why we think certain art is great and certain art is not. And you know, I, I'm married to an artist. My, my wife is a graphic artist. She went to the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, she's given me a veritable education every time we go to a museum. <laughs> she gives the best museum tour lecture I've ever heard. She laughed at that premise. And she said, look, what Dutton is doing is explaining mediocre art. <laughs> right. um, if you go out and you paint these stereotypical sentimental landscapes, that's nice. It's going to end up in, in, in Motel 6 over right. the bed, OK? Right. <laughs> um, but what do we regard as great art? And we had the opportunity last year to go on vacation in Spain. And for the very first time, of course, I've seen prints of it before. But for the very first time, I stood in front of Picasso's Guernica. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. That's yeah. not colorful. No. That doesn't have any water in no. it. No. <laughs> it doesn't have any small children. It has some animals, but it has animals in extreme agony. It's the most powerful piece of art I've ever seen. And Dutton's theory about art and sexual selection has, does nothing to explain it. Right. Um, and as one critic of Dutton book sa Dutton's book says, when nearly every great painting in the Museum of Art violates your theory, 
<laughs> maybe it's maybe it's time to discard the theory. <laughs> right. Call it the Motel Six uh, art yeah, theory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? You, you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had uh, the great conversation. I loved everything you guys have talked about. Seems like there's one thing that's missing that actually fits in with an epiphany I recently had uh, with a colleague at work who was a creationist. And he and I had a constant dialogue about evolution and creationism and idea and all that. And we sort of had we sort of had a joint epiphany that fits in with what you said. And that was that he said, despite what scientists say, there's no way that evolution can describe how life evolved from dust. And that was the key word. So suddenly we launched off onto this parallel conversation about it's not dust, it's the periodic table and the four <laughs> forces of the universe, weak, strong, gravitational gravity, yada, yada, yada. And so there's a whole structure within which we live that evolution does not de describe. But given that as a basis and taking that as a, as a given, from that point forward, evolution works to describe you know, why a certain bird has a longer beak, et cetera, all the way to us. And my friend, who was, uh, had been very well educated in the sciences as youth, he didn't understand the periodic table and the four fundamental forces of the universe, and he didn't understand these scientific assumptions that evolution is based on. So for him it was an epiphany, and for me it was an epiphany because I realized that a lot of people, creationists, they don't understand that when evolutionists say we can explain so much that we can explain, it's based on certain assumptions that we can't explain, sort of what you were saying about the need for God or Catholicism or whatever. Anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, no, I, no, I, think, I, I, I think you raised some very good points, and, and uh, um, you know, w w one of them is that, that word "dust" is very intentionally chosen, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because of course it appears it appears in the Book of Genesis, right. and um, the I've actually made almost exactly the same point to some creationist after public lectures, and um, you know, and I said, you know, uh, it, 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 God couldn't have fashioned humans out of dust because dust has far too little carbon and too much silicon. <laughs> and, <laughs> And his answer was, well, maybe it was very special dust. <laughs> yeah. Fairy dust, um, yes. But, but the, 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 one of the points that creationists love to raise is abiogenesis, mm -hmm. which is the origin of the first living cell. That's not evolution. That is a separate problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I admit, if you want to rule out a creation event, you have to explain where the first living cell came from. So it's a significant scientific problem. It's not a solved problem. But on the other hand, it's not fair to say that we don't know anything about it. Um, we actually know um, that basic physical processes can produce the building blocks of life, and they do it all the time. And not just in experiments by Stanley Miller, very faint, no relation, in the 1950s on this issue, but also when NASA or the European Space Agency are able to capture comets and meteorites, do you know what they find in them? They find amino acids. Um, so the, in the universe itself, basic physical processes can produce the building blocks of life. And we can go a little bit further. A friend of mine, a friend of mine at Harvard, Jack Schostak, is working on this and is doing extraordinary stuff along these areas. But it is agreed an unsolved problem. To, for evolution to take place, you first have to have a self-replicating system. Once you have a self-replicating system, evolution can kick in. So it's a separate problem, but it's, it's an important one. <coughs> and you also have to have a periodic table that allows for all these complicated molecules. You got it. Yeah. There might be another universe where there's only three elements on the periodic table, and the whole universe is just gray nothingness because it, there wasn't enough inherent complexity to evolve. That's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Question uh, from the peanut gallery. Uh, Thomas Nowitzki asks, and you guys touched on this briefly, oh, okay. uh, why are you Catholic over any other religion? And I would get more specific, why are you Catholic as opposed to all the other Christian denominations? <laughs> okay, well, well th th my answer to that is short and simple. Um, and the answer is, it is the faith tradition in which I was raised. It's one that I understand. It's one that, frankly, I walked away from twice in my life deciding it was absolute nonsense, that only stupid people believed in God at all. Um, and both times I came back to it. And um, I came back to Catholicism uh, in part because, again, it's a faith I understand. Um, I, 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 I tried to indicate um, that I certainly have respect for people who pursue other religions. I'm not an absolutist Catholic who thinks the only way to salvation is through the church or anything along those lines. But I will also tell your questioner, um, the second time I came back to Catholicism and why, um, and as I just sort of walked away from it, um, I've always been interested in writing, even though I was a scientist. 
And at one point in college, I took two courses in verse writing, poetry writing, poetry writing workshops. I actually had several poems published when I was an undergrad. Uh, and I hope, by the way, no one ever finds them <laughs> for a number of reasons. Um, but our professor um, tried to develop our verse writing skills by giving us five or six examples of poems by a very famous poet, by Robert Lowell, by Elizabeth Bishop, by somebody along those lines, and having us write next week imitation poems in that style. And I wasn't very good at this. But one day he gave me a set of poems, and I really liked it. And I wrote imitations of these. And I hand them back. And the professor called me up at, a couple days after handing them back and said, these are the best imitations you've ever written. You really like this guy, don't you? I said, I sure do. <laughs> he said, do you know anything about him? Now, you have, you have to remember, I couldn't Google him. This is before the information <laughs> age. Um, and you know, I didn't have an encyclopedia. I didn't know, I didn't know who Thomas Merton was. And he said, do you realize that he is a Trappist monk? <laughs> and it set me back in my, in my, uh, on my heels. Because here was this guy who had such beautiful command over the language. And he had taken vows of an order which included a vow of silence. So he had joined an order where you do not speak, even though he wrote this extraordinarily beautiful poetry. I said, i got to find out more about this dude. So I go into the bookstore, and I find some books of poems, which I bought. But then I found a, kind of an autobiography called The Seven Story Mountain, which was published in the late 1940s, was a national bestseller. And it was about his life as a skeptical and very secular youth at Columbia University in the 1940s. And I saw it as precisely parallel to my own life in a skeptical and very secular Brown University where I was an undergrad in the 1960s. And it did two things. It disabused me of the notion that only stupid people believe in God. That was the first thing. And second, th second thing, it pointed to the sort of questions that faith can answer. Now, I'll admit that, that Merton, was, Merton was in the Roman Catholic tradition very much. But he also um, wrote influentially towards the end of his life about Buddhism um, mm -hmm. and basically wrote many articles about being a contemplative Christian and a contemplative Buddhist. And he found these two traditions interlocking. So I would love to aspire to have the level of belief and understanding that was characteristic of, of someone like Thomas Merton. But for me, he was my inspiration to basically say that faith helps to put your life in context it gives you a, a genuine reason behind your sense of right and wrong, good and evil, what is the good life, and so forth. And for me, it's been enormously valuable in helping for me to, for want of a better way of describing it, get my bearings in the very difficult business of being alive. Very good. <laughs> Anybody up here in the peanut gallery up there? Uh, <laughs> yep. Um, Question. Going back to art and the purpose of art, I think a lot of artists would say that the purpose is to evoke feeling, and that's kind of what you touched on earlier. So if we assume that the purpose of art is to evoke feeling, then can we really talk about the evolution of artwork without discussing the evolution of feeling and emotion? Um, I, that's a great point, and I'll, mm -hmm. I will take your point, which is I don't think you can. Um, you know, from the, the, the art, Human creation of art goes back at least 25,000 years. And some of the cave art that we know about in southern France and other places, by modern art standards, is extraordinary. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we have an ability, and it would seem a need, to create images that reflect the world around us. And um, part of that, I think, is to crystallize experience. And I think certainly part of it is to evoke feelings. And when you tour a museum and, and, and you see uh, the works of the, the great masters, they're not just technically really good paintings. Photographs can be that. But they are evocative in a way uh, where there are little incongruities or little ways in which people or individuals or emotions are represented um, that set you back and make you think. Um, and you know, I, I, I'll, I'm going to describe one that is, in fact, a religious painting. But that's not the reason I'm bringing it up. My, my, wife, uh, my wife is much less religious than I am, trust me. And we had the opportunity to go to Rome a couple of years ago. And um, we uh, basically made up a hit list of the pieces of art that we wanted to see. And one of the problems with that in Rome is a lot of these great pieces of art are in little bitty churches that are scattered around the city. 
And finally, we went into a church called Santa Maria de Popolo, St. Mary of the People. And there are in there two, um, you know, absolutely incredible paintings by Caravaggio. One of them is the crucifixion of St. Peter, um, and the other one is the conversion of St. Paul. And they're in a little side altar area. There was a crowd of maybe 20 people there. To protect them from the light, from bleaching their very dim corner, you have to drop a euro coin in to get like <laughs> six minutes of light so you can actually see them. I had a pocket full of euro coins, man. I was, <laughs> pumping, I was pumping those suckers in there. And I'm fix I love Caravaggio. I'm fixated uh, on the crucifixion of Paul. Paul was crucified upside down. Sorry, Peter was crucified upside down according to legend. It appears in many pieces of art. But in this case, Caravaggio allowed himself to imagine what would it be like to have a, a full weight of a living human body nailed to a cross and being lifted into the upside down position. And you can see the, the people who are his executioners straining and pulling at every sinew. And you see their agony and you see Peter's agony. It's just extraordinary. Then I look across no farther than that wall and my wife is standing next to the conversion uh, of, 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 of St. Paul. And Paul, by legend, has been struck from his horse. He's knocked to the ground. His horse is standing over him. And there is supposedly a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why doth thou persecute me? Now, there are no words in the painting. But I look over there, and I see my wife right next to it, and tears are streaming down her face. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, what happened? And I made my way through the crowd, and I said, honey, what's going on? And she says, this for me, you have to appreciate she's an equestrian. She's a horse lover. But there's a lot more than a horse in this painting. She says, this for me is the most moving painting in the world. And for the first time, I'm standing right in front of it, and I can't control myself. Wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm seconding your thesis that that's one of the reasons for painting. And uh, I think Caravaggio was, uh, at, for his period, maybe better than anyone else at capturing emotion and sentiment and agony and joy and ecstasy in human faces. And you can see it in all of his paintings. Do Sorry you, to get on a rant, but I, I just love these paintings. Do you have an opinion of when symbolic communication or the capacity for symbolism comes online in the human brain, 100,000 years, or, I, or even why, why that would happen? I, I, I wish I did, but I'm not enough of an yeah, anthropologist yeah, yeah. to have an educated, yeah. uh, educated opinion in those respects. We're, we're, I mean, the, 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 the oldest known human languages include things like Sanskrit and Phoenician. Right. Um, and they, they don't go back much more than about 10,000 years. Um, the cave paintings I've spoken about, to my knowledge, are between twenty and 30,000 years old. Right. I consider them to be symbolic yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, Thank you. I'm just wondering why is it or is it possible that the teaching of ID couldn't be struck down because it violates the separation of church and state? Oh, well, that was exactly the reason that it was struck down in Kitzmiller versus Dover. Mm -hmm. and and And... I'll tell you what the most compelling testimony was. It wasn't mine. Um, basically, um, what I was trying to tell the judge is that the so-called idea of intelligent design is really a set of bad arguments as to why certain things can't, couldn't have been produced by evolution. That's the so-called evidence for intelligent design. But here's what really got to the judge. Um, the book that was presented as a textbook on intelligent design was called Of Pandas and People. Um, Prior to the trial, our attorneys executed a discovery petition, a, a, a subpoena deuces tecum, I think it's called, um, to the publishers of that book to say, we'd like you to produce editorial drafts, first drafts, revisions, and so forth for examination. They, the publishers sent us 7,000 pages oh, wow. of typescript, first draft, second draft, so forth and so on. They, this went, these went to the genuine hero of the trial. It wasn't me, it wasn't paleontologist Kevin Padian, it was Barbara Forrest, a professor of philosophy at Southeastern Louisiana University. Barbara went through all 7,000 pages, and what she discovered was that the original draft of this book was a book on creation science that referred to the creator this and the creator that, and this was created and this was done. In, when was Edwards versus Aguilar? 88? Okay, 1988, the Edwards versus Aguilar case, the Supreme Court says by a seven to two majority, 
The teaching of creationism is inherently religious and is therefore constitutionally impermissible. Okay, the next draft, right after Edwards versus Aguilard, every, the, the book was unchanged, but every mention of creator was changed to designer. And uh, what I want you to imagine is that you had to do this in Microsoft Word and do it quickly, okay? <laughs> so you would do a global find and replace, right? So you type in creator and you change it to designer and bingo. But every now and then, if you've ever done global find and replace, you discover that a word is sometimes embedded mm -hmm. yes. in the middle and when it changes it, it makes something ridiculous, okay? <laughs> so um, what, um, what was originally there was something like creation proponents. Um, and when they did the global find and replace, there was a, a string of letters together that said, see design proponentists as a single <laughs> word. And that was what Barbara referred to as a, a, a literary fossil, a transitional form <laughs> that, that showed that this was a bold-faced attempt. Intelligent design is not a perfectly legitimate secular scientific theory. It is an attempt to cloak creationism in different language. And when the judge saw this, that was the decisive thing in the case. And that's why he's, he basically said, intelligent design cannot conceal its creationist and therefore its religious roots. And that's why it's constitutionally impermissible. Mm -hmm. It's a marvelous decision. As, as Ed pointed out, and this is gonna sound very strange, unfortunately, the citizens of Dover agreed and they voted that entire school board out of office and replaced them with some of the plaintiffs in the case. That's why it never went to the Supreme Court because the only people with standing to appeal to the Circuit Court of Appeals was the school board and once the bad guys were voted out, the good guys didn't want to appeal so therefore it never went uh, uh, so far as to establish precedent. And in a way, that's unfortunate. Maybe yeah, they should have done for and, president. Well, just yeah. like <laughs> it would have been very disingenuous right, right. for these people to d make yeah, an appeal. Right. But as Ken noted, that decision was not like the striking down the anti-evolution statue. It wasn't unanimous. It was instead seven to two. Mm -hmm. That included Justice Scalia. Not everyone believes the same thing about separation of church and state. And the real risk now oh, no. is they're going to change the meaning of separation of church and state. Right. There's at least three judges no. who do not believe in, because the whole history of the separation of church and state really goes <coughs> only goes back to Justice Black in the 1940s, 50s. And so that could, well, that was actually a little later. <coughs> Justice later, yeah. Black okay. brought it. Um, so the, there's a real danger. Um, for example, Justice Thomas does not believe that the First Amendment separation of church and state applies to state and local school districts because it simply says that Congress shall make no law respecting the established religion. And therefore, states and local school districts should be free to do whatever they want. And they have Justice Alito and the latest justice appointed by um, President uh, Trump who also are in that same, so we are looking at a possibility of a fundamental redefinition of what the separation of church and state means in the United States, which would lead to a different result, yep. even in the facts as brought forth in Dover. Yeah, now the other thing that's worth pointing out, and Ed pointed out, the First Amendment begins, Congress shall make no law, right. okay? And um, I have another daughter who's a history teacher, and she's pointed out to me that in the early days of the Constitutional Republic, there were nine of the 13 states that had official state religions. Mm -hmm. mm. And this, these were not challenged right. by the First Amendment. In Massachusetts, it was Congregationalist. Mm -hmm. um, and try to remember, in Quakers in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, it was Dutch Reformed Church, was actually the official church of the state. Um, and it was only when the, uh, the Bill of Rights uh, was applied to the states as a whole, mm -hmm. and that ha happens actually after the Civil War, that basically the First Amendment is then construed to apply broadly in this respect. But as Ed pointed out, this may not be settled law, and one of the, either the great things or one of the terrifying things about the United States Supreme Court is it is not bound by precedent. The Supreme Court can do what it wants. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, back to the conversation about um, human consciousness. Yeah. I'm curious about your, about your thoughts on the singularity and the idea that at some point human consciousness will meld with some form of artificial intelligence and machine learning. You've been watching the Big Bang Theory a lot? 
Okay. Or Westworld. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, a lot of us, um, you know, I might take this out of my pocket and, and point that I feel absolutely naked when I don't have this uh, around with me, and maybe my consciousness has begun to meld in that in, 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 in some respect. And every time I see somebody with one of those little uh, Bluetooth things where they're just strolling through an airport and apparently talking into nothing, um, um, I, think, I, I think we're getting a little closer to that. But, but I think that the current state of artificial intelligence in terms of how close it has come um, basically to, to mimicking human thought or human analysis and so forth. Um, I think the current state of AI is much, much farther away from that mm -hmm. than people uh, mm -hmm. believe or that they fear. Um, the, you, know, you can do absolutely wonderful things with artificial intelligence in a very, within a very limited series of choices. Um, and I was struck by the fact, um, I told you I'd drive a pickup truck, I was struck by the fact that um, my pickup truck had a kind of artificial intelligence in it um, that I hadn't even thought of, which is when I went up to the truck on the driver's side door and I unlocked the driver's side door, that's the only side that unlocked. But if I go up on the passenger side and unlock it, both sides unlock. And that tells me that somebody has thought about this limited situation. Um, why would anyone unlock just the passenger side? Clearly, you, wanna, you wanna go in the driver's side. On the other hand, if, you're, if there's only one driver, you might not want to unlock the passenger side. Anyway, it struck me as clever programming. And there are other examples of it as well. But it's within a very limited range of possibilities. And one of the things that distinguishes the human nervous system is our ability to deal with an enormous range of possibilities. I don't think AI is there yet. I'm not really concerned um, about our humanity being compromised. Uh, by robotics, they may take some of our jobs away, but I don't think they'll 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 compromise our intellect anytime soon. Could it make the jump? Could artificial intelligence make the jump to consciousness? Well, that would be interesting. Um, I, I you know I'm not I'm not a computer science person, so I'm I'm going <laughs> to plead ignorance on this. Um, we have we have a lot of people at my university working on artificial intelligence, um, and you know what they, what they tell me is, you know this is going to be a really really powerful tool but always within, a, always within our lifetime within a limited range of possibilities. Um, we can debate whether or not a machine can ever become self-conscious. Um, and that's an interesting thing to debate, but I don't think that's within the technological realm of possibility. There was a really interesting article, which I actually quoted in my book, uh, in the New York Times called The Brain is a Computer, and it was written by Kenneth D. Miller. Um, I, have, I have the misfortune to have a very common name. Um, I'm Kenneth R. I'm a biologist. Kenneth D. is at Columbia. He's a neuroscientist. And by the way, Kenneth G. Miller is at Rutgers, and he's a climate scientist. And, and, I've, <laughs> and I've met all of them, and I get three or four emails a year, seriously, asking me to chair a session at a neuroscience meeting. And my response always is, I'd be absolutely delighted to, but I know nothing about neuroscience. <laughs> you want the guy at Columbia. And then I get hate mail saying, I really despise your, your, your stance on climate science. And then I have to write it back and I said, well, I do have a stance on climate science, but I think you want the guy at Rutgers. <laughs> um, and I finally spoke at Rutgers a couple years ago and I wanted to meet Kenneth, uh, Kenneth G. And he said, now I know why people email me complaining about my stance on evolution. <laughs> so, so it was all very funny. But, so I, I'm sorry to go off of that, but like I said, um, you know, I, I know all the Ken Millers in science at this point, I think, but um, Ken's article in the New York Times was basically to say that anyone who thinks that we'll be able to download our brains into a computer or we'll have a computer that will simulate the human brain within the next 200 years is being hopelessly naive. The, mm -hmm. the nervous system can be, uh, you can make an analogy between logic circuits in a computer and a brain, but it's a crude analogy. And it doesn't begin to get close to the subtlety and the complexity of an individual neuron and its multiple connections. So the, 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 the brain far surpasses anything we can even conceive of in a computer. So um, I'm, I'm not betting on the singularity anytime soon. Sheldon Cooper notwithstanding. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. I have to share my favorite bumper sticker. It said, evolution is just a theory, like gravity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My, my favorite bumper sticker appeared 
uh, several copies of it in the men's room at the Federal District Courthouse during the Kitz Miller trial. And it was put out by a former student of mine named Colin Purrington, who was a professor at Swarthmore. And the, the bumper sticker simply said, we have the fossils, we win. <laughs> When I visited Dayton, uh, right right in front of uh, Dayton College, there, um, there instead of no parking, it said "Thou shalt not park here," which I thought was funny. <laughs> That's good. And then my other favorite bumper sticker was uh, "Militant Agnostic." I don't know, and you don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we we shall end it. Uh, Ken, congratulations on your book. It's a beautiful book. It's a great Thank read. You so much. Thank you. Thank great you. read. Nicely done. Thank you for watching. Check us out at skeptic.com and support our mission to promote science and critical thinking at Patreon. <laughs>